everybody. Welcome to Frame Trap, a podcast where we huddle in somebody's garage and enthusiastically talk about video games. I am your host, Ben Moore. Joining me today, Mr. Bradley Ellis to my right here. Hello. Hi. And to the right of him is Michael Damiani. It's been a while, It's been Damiani. a while. It's been a while. How you doing? It's been a while. I wanted to say achievements, Brad. I almost back, said that too, but, but I was like, "Oh, wrong show." Wrong show. <laughs> it was like, "No." But yes, I'm doing well. It's man. your birthday. It's, it's your birthday? birthday. It's Michael Damiani's birthday. Wow! And, and dropping my, that on the frame trap. Damn, dude. It, exclu- shadow dropped. Yep. Sick. It's only Damiani's birthday on this podcast. Happy birthday, dude! Not in any other Easy Alice content. Yep. Yep. Oh man. Only in this window as well. And you know how. You're celebrating your birthday at least partially. I, I came, I come in. I mean, it was the first one here, sitting at the table watching some Dragon Ball Z. Night, dude. Streaming some Dragon Ball Z. Such a good Z. birthday, yeah. Garlic Junior. That's my kind of birthday. Yeah, that's a good birthday, down there. I, mean, I like stuff. it. I, <laughs> it's so sad because now with birthdays, I like, I don't want to like go out and do anything too you. crazy. Like, I do, the, my birthday is like, I don't want to deal with traffic. I just want to stay. Yeah, in my birthday is like, hey, yeah, I just, yeah, I just want to play video games, eat yeah. some food. That's about it. Yeah. We're old. Are well, we old? Uh, I guess. There are, I'm at a point now, I'm almost 29, uh-huh. I'm at a point now where I, I see some things and I'm like, oh man, that makes me feel really old. Like when you're getting into some, this happens to me all the time, like when you're getting into some music, right? Yes. And you're like, oh my god, this person is so talented, they're so good, I'm really into this this track or this album or whatever it is. And then you know, you do the thing, you look them up on Wikipedia and you're like, oh, they're 20, Cool. what's going on? Yeah. What Which, have I done with my life? Once you hit great. that uh, that dirty thirty, Ben. The dirty thirty. Then you're like, whew. I was looking up uh, hockey players on yeah. rosters because I was curious sick. about some stuff, and all the rosters I was looking at, all the birthday years, like ninety two, ninety five, ninety five, ninety seven, ninety five. I was like, like mid nineties. I was like, huh. Hi, twenty year old kids. I was right. Like, oh. Wait, 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 wait. Who, who's your team, Damiani? So. It's a weird order here. I loved when I, I like everyone who grew up in either the the ladies in ni- like through the nineties. Wayne Gretzky was my favorite player. Kings baby then. So, but I I was more enthralled with what he had done already. <laughs> so mm-hmm. when he went to the Kings, I was kind of like, oh cool, Kings might win because he's on there. So that's the only reason I care about Kings. For whatever reason, I like the Blackhawks, Chicago Blackhawks, and then yeah. the Dallas Stars, the home team, because they oh that's because yeah, they moved down team, from right? Minnesota. And they came out of nowhere and was like, wait, there's a hockey team in Texas? What? Mm-hmm. And then they got good. Yeah. For a few years, they were only known for having this player who got into brawls with everyone. His name was Shane Sh- uh, Is it Shrua. Shrua? Yeah. Basically a goon. Just went around, beat up everybody. People would cheer him. They got good. <laughs> they won the Stanley Cup. Everyone was like, holy crap. You know, they're, they're pretty good. And so, yeah, it was stars, basically stars. Nice. And cheering for Wayne Gretzky. It's because I played roller hockey. Oh, yeah, me too. And our team was called, was named after the Chicago Blackhawks. So I was like, okay, well, I like them too. When I was extremely young, I vaguely remember playing some roller hockey, you know, with the neighborhood kids getting nice. together, yeah, dude. waiting for the ice cream truck to come up the hill. But I remember, like, every roller hockey session, I didn't play that many, but I remember, like, every roller hockey session that I did, just, like, Getting way cut short because like the ball went down the drain or something, yeah, yeah. or you lost the it, ball, or yeah. like there were too many cars coming by. So yeah. I played never, with... never quite as like hype as I, I think yeah. we thought it was going to be. I played for like years on teams in roller hockey. Oh, I real played up teams? In, yeah, just I played like, up until okay. high school. I quit. Like mm, junior nice. high, I was our captain of our team and everything. Nice. nice. Then I hit high school and I was like, man, I don't like playing sports anymore. Cause like, wow. Because you got to go to practice, dude. It's like, I don't want to go to practice right yeah, now. Only more, Brad would say that. They get more serious that. about practices yeah, when you like, get to high school. And everyone got like really nuts about yeah. like and super competitive. Yeah. And I was just like, eh, I don't it's really care lot. that See, much. That's, and this is probably just my school. I'm not trying to like generalize for all people out there, but that's kind of why I fell into like running in high school. Because mm, yeah. like... Just to, again, on my own personal experience, the football team was taking it way too seriously. It wasn't any fun. The basketball yeah, yeah. team was taking it way too seriously. It wasn't any fun. The running team was just it's like... Pretty chill. Kind of a, yeah, but like a nice collection of weirdos that like knew how to have a good time. Got, got a few double yeah. men in there stuff. running and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, because I mean, you know, you're running for miles. <laughs> you strike up some conversation. Yeah, it's like, yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, before, absolutely. you know, before the big meet, you come together, you have a bunch of pasta. It was a good time. Oh, yeah, carb up, baby. Yeah, it was the, the <laughs> highlight of my like sporting experience. Awesome. Wait, yeah. do you do you like hockey, man? Do you have a hockey team you like? Um, I have a weird history with hockey. Uh, growing up, my cousin, who like, 
I didn't have any siblings growing up, and so like I idolized my cousin, and so anything that he was into, I was mm-hmm. into. Uh, and he was big into the Chicago Blackhawks, nice. and just kind of through like being around Good him, so. yeah, Blackhawks. I was kind of into it. Um, and then in high school, a friend of mine was really into hockey, and I wanted to get really into hockey, and so I actually like took some lessons and stuff with this friend, oh, and we we played around for a little sick. bit, and. I always thought, much like many things, much like wrestling in my life, I always thought hockey was really cool, but I never, I never like fully dove into the pool. Gotcha. Like I always felt like I had like yeah. my toes in it, but I was never. It helps if you got a friend who's really into it. Yeah, that friend went and ended up going to another school. Oh. Um, either the next year or the year after that, I don't remember. But yeah, that was kind of my mm. weird spotty history with cool. with hockey. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to say about the ages, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, I went to like the Smite. World Championship thing in Atlanta. Mm. Cool. And well, they Atlanta? had, yeah, it was cool. in Atlanta. They had like this brochure uh, of all the players, and kids were like, I think there was a kid that was like thirteen. It was like thirteen, Damn. fifteen. Parent permission, parent slip, dude. Yeah, that was the, that was the weirdest. And they came onto like the bus I was on, and they just looked like little dweebs. Like little, little little dweebs, and you're just like. I hope it works out for yeah, you, man. Luck, I hope man. this might thing works out. I hope you're not throwing away your school. I felt like a very concerned. Like how crazy is that? None of that like existed when we were that young. Yeah, it's yes. You just like Twitch is something that you don't really think about all that often, but that is a remarkably new phenomenon. Even yeah. YouTube is a remarkably yeah, new phenomenon. Yeah, just like can you imagine if we had that? We'd have so many embarrassing videos of us being little idiots on yeah. videos. I'm like, thank God I didn't have that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank God. Definitely. I'm glad that some of my younger days were not on video. Yeah. That's for sure. Uh, speaking of that, though, I, I, I can't help but feel a little bit nostalgic, I think, when I was a kid, because just not having as many options. Like, sometimes mm-hmm. as a kid, it was like, all right, well, either I play video games, I go outside, I read a book. Or I watch a movie. Yeah. Like, you know, you couldn't you couldn't just be like, I'm going to get lost in YouTube for two hours. And you couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. And, like, I enjoy getting lost in YouTube for a couple of hours sometimes, but and it's, it's also like, nice to not have you that. You live option. in Iowa, so sometimes the weather wouldn't behave. Oh, I would say most of the most time, of the time felt so like the weather like, wouldn't behave. Maybe you got to take the that time, a factor. But... Like, I live in California, so it was, like, right. pretty chill, like, any time to go outside. Right. But, like, yeah, you're like, oh, yeah. I want to go outside today. It's just a blizzard. Well, Can't it was it was many things. It was either like, oh, okay, it's flooding, it's a blizzard, it's too hot. Like, jeez, it was it was all the things, all the elements. But yeah, I don't miss the cold. I know yeah. some people really like the winter. That's their thing. Not I think me, like I like the winter because I grew up here. I don't yeah. know winter like sure. everyone else knows winter. I get that. It's precious. Yeah. It's rare. It's a rare thing. Don't ruin it for me, everybody. Uh, to get started with our our game discussion here, Damiani, you've played something. And I'm, I'm disappointed in myself that I haven't played it yet, but you've played it, you're a preview about it, you've got some things to say about a game that all three of us are eagerly anticipating, and that's Valkyria Chronicles 4. Oh, baby. Talk oh, to me yeah. about that. Valkyria Chronicles 4. That, uh, I actually don't know if that demo was a stealth drop or not. I was not. I knew the game was coming out in Japan this month, but I didn't know that they were going to release a demo. I just saw the tweet go out that said, hey, Japanese PSN, Valkyria 4 is out. I was like, okay. Like, the demo. I was like, I'm going now. Yeah. Like, dropping everything. I'm going in. Because every... I stopped watching trailers for that game after the second one. Because everything I saw on the trailer was, like, just spoke to me in terms of this is what I've been waiting for in a follow-up to Valkyria Chronicles. Yeah. So, what is that? What is the... What is what you want? What is being presented here that that strikes true to that Valkyria sense, sure. Michael Damiani? Uh, yeah. To, to, so, to back up... Um, obviously I loved the original Valkyria Chronicles and the, mm. the elements it introduced. Um, you can read this in any Wikipedia article. It's basically like it's the Soccer Wars team basically got back together after and decided to make Sega said like make us a new series. And the two director, the director and producer put on Valkyria, one worked on a series called Nightshade. Uh, the other one worked on something you might have heard of called uh, Skies of Arcadia. And they took elements from all those series and put them together, and they got Valkyria Chronicles. Mm -hmm. And I honestly had not played anything like it before. It was real-time tactics, strategy, RPG, but you can move around, complete control of your character when you're moving around. Enemies would react to you in real time. It was like 
objectives thrown at you inv involving the environments. Like you can climb up watchtowers to get like a height advantage, scope around, take cut. There was n like regular cover that was like intended where you could duck down. It would that would actually affect your stats. Then there was natural cover where it's like you break line of sight. It was all. It was just like so like fun to play something like that. So refreshing to see something like that. And it it did well enough. It sold well enough here. It got pretty good reviews. And Sega's like, hey, let's keep let's keep this ball rolling. We got Valkyrie Chronicles 2 here. And while I enjoyed that game and think it was a pretty good game, the problem was it was for PlayStation Portable. Mm -hmm. And as such, they designed the game in a different way in terms of the, the map structure. So the original maps in the, in the original game, these pretty large maps, like an entire mm -hmm. town would be a map. Or the infamous Mission 7, where it's this giant like desert area with these like structures you gotta break down because there's a giant tank just moving around. There's like a <laughs> gargantuan <laughs> tank yeah. just moving around all over the place. And it's like the scale was really good. It all just got like shrunk down for PSP. Maps weren't even like uh, coherent in terms of like uh, seamless transition. It was you go to a you'd capture a base and he could warp to the next part of the map and it was just so fractured and, and, and disjointed because of that it didn't really live up to the original Valkyria and while there was a third one we never got here that was Japanese only mm -hmm. uh, they made some of the they added a bunch of new classes basically to kind of counter that shortcoming mm -hmm. but a lot of people didn't get to play it period and it's still. It was still missing that the the the, the complex objectives, the the, the sweeping maps. I, I kind of missed that element of it. And two had the stupid high school academy yeah, setting. I was about to say. They went like full anime. They went all in with like the tropes. I was just like, no, this is supposed to be something that was trying. The original game tried to tackle an alternate take on World War Two. They tried yeah. to touch upon. Pretty serious subjects. I know it gets mocked a lot for, like, I shot someone. I'm going to do a cute pose and stuff. But at the same time, the actual narrative touches upon some really serious topics and does it in a pretty decent way, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's surprising. I don't think that when you look at Valkyria Chronicles for the outside, it's... It's surprising some of the things that they touch upon uh, in regards to war and race specifically. I'm not saying that it handles it amazingly and is yeah. like a comprehensive, excellent view on it, but they, they go a lot further than I personally was expecting in Valkyria Chronicles 1. I haven't played uh, Valkyria Chronicles 2 and I haven't played Valkyria Chronicles 3, um, but just kind of like the conversation that I've seen surrounding Valkyria Chronicles 4, I've seen a little bit of worry that it's too much like one and is not taking the things from two and three that were good and implementing them. Some people are worried that maybe it's, it's too much of a throwback. Again, I'm kind of watching this from the outside and I haven't played Valky the Valkyria Chronicles 4 demo, but that's kind of what I've seen. But it sounds like maybe to you, you like that. You like kind of that return to the vibe and gameplay of Valkyria Chronicles 1. Yeah, I, I, think, that's all, I think it's a little bit jumping the gun to, to claim it's just too much like Valkyria 1, especially when most of the criticism leverage against 2 and 3 were, why isn't it more like yeah. Valkyria 1? Mm -hmm. I, I think the the real like boiling point for all this was the spinoff Valkyria Revolution because <laughs> it was a, a spinoff. No one asked for that. They like When I saw it, I was like, this might work, but why didn't you just make another... like? A Valkyria Chronicles Four. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you make, giving me Revolution? Or could you call it Valkyria Chronicles Four and give me some more faith? Like, didn't review well, didn't sell very well. I keep seeing like the 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 discount price of it going down and down. But I thought that was the end. I was like, well, that's the end of Valkyria because that one bombed hard. And but Sega had already greenlit. No one knew about it, but Sega greenlit the fall before Revolution even came out. Valkyria 4, mm -hmm. and then last year, fall, they were like, hey, it's coming. I was like, oh, there's hope again. Uh, yeah, besides like the map stuff, it's just the, like the tone, especially if I'm playing the demo, the things that I like about it is just like the tone. It's back to being, like, it, it's very war focused. There's no overtly goofy, like, there's still tropes in there, but it feels much more like the vibe I got from Valkyria One mm -hmm. with the with the camaraderie and the and the squad E or uh, it's something E. Uh, I forget what the if it's actually squad E or just group E or whatever E. Mm -hmm. the, the the bonding they have, the character development, it seemed to be 
in line with what I enjoyed in Valkyria 1. So that was a pleasant thing to see about it. But the biggest draw of it was that on the second mission, there's a tutorial mission. First kind of basic mission. It's not it's not really a cakewalk. First the first real mission is you gotta storm basically this like fortress. Uh it looks like a, a, a castle meets a, an academy type thing. And on the ramparts are a bunch of like turret guns. And they have the height advantage and they like they, they can outgun you. And you gotta find a way to pick them off from the sides and and also use the the mortar class, which you know can so you can like raise the camera up and down to like get different perspectives, try and drop the mortar shells on them, which is kind of cool. But it wasn't anything too unique. It was just kind of like a corridor level. You just got to find a way to survive the end. The yeah. second mission, this is where it gets good. It's fog of war, bunch of complex objectives thrown at you. You're locked behind a gate. So you got to take an alternate route a long way around through the villa. It's set in this like really dense village that uh with so you're basically in the streets trying to walk through the streets and the narrow like back alleys and stuff and your te- your objective is to identify tanks because you're going to take them out but the catch is because it's fog of war you can't the the enemy has taken advantage of that and has put up wooden like replicas of tanks but to you the player they appear to be legit they look uh, they're indistinguishable from a normal looking tank you can't shoot them from afar um and tell that they're fake because you're like, oh, I'll shoot the Ragnite, the blue thing on the back. They'll blow yeah. them up. If you do that, whether you do that on a fake or a real, it does no damage. For uh, hmm. uh, uh, It was in Japanese, so I didn't know the explanation for that. So I'm assuming there's a good explanation why they don't take the real ones to take damage. Mm-hmm. But you have to get up close, really up close to them. And then you'll like relay the reconnaissance back. This one's a fake. This one's a real. And you got to go through the whole map with Fog of War and do that. While there's regular soldiers and stuff, there's enemy encampments you gotta take over. And that's just part one of that mission. The second mission is you gotta coordinate with the anti tank units out back uh, uh, beyond the borders of the uh, level. And you gotta shoot towers with the, they have these like codes on them, like these number codes. And you gotta shoot the numbers to switch them to the right code. It's 715, so they're all off by like one digit. But they're only, uh, you can only hit them from one side of the tower. So you gotta like go around, take snipers, get in certain spots, and shoot them, and then it will signal the the, the anti tank units to fire, and they'll clear a path. If you try and go out, otherwise the tanks will just like slaughter you. Mm-hmm. Like I was like so confused at first. I was like, "There's like nowhere to go. Like I'm gonna get wrecked. What do you do?" So that it was nice to see those two things thrown together, and that's mission two. Right. So that's the second mission. They're throwing all that at you. So that gave me. That that instilled me with a lot of faith about what objective wise, yeah, the complexity they're gonna throw. There's at so you. much in there, and it's just a demo too. Oh like, yeah, if for just like a that's, tiny slice, there's so much. That's not even it. What? That's there's more, Bradley what? Ellis. If you manage to beat the two missions, you get an extra mission. Oh, it is a snowy village with like hills and stuff, and you have anti. Uh, you have the mortar units on the opposing side. They're bombarding you. So when mm-hmm. you run, you are getting hit by mortar shells if you don't dodge them. And if you get it, it does the whole ringing ear effect and stuff like that. So you're like distorted. So you get like you're super prone and vulnerable. It's like, oh, whoa, this is you can't just storm this. You got to like have to figure out safe paths and stuff. They hide the units in like really clever spots. Um, if you if you just rush in, there's like, oh, there's three people, not one person, three soldiers right here waiting for you and the tank. Bam, 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 you're dead. I was like, okay, maybe I should actually scout out the area first. Uh, it's not that terribly difficult, but it will punish you if you try and do the scout tactic, basically, like rush the scout out mm-hmm. and like, oh, I'm invincible. I'm a scout. Mm-hmm. Uh, scout's still a little OP, but we'll see how long. Like, It's <laughs> only mission two and a bonus mission, so they might have learned yeah. a lesson. But it's a lot for a demo. Yeah, and then so, you get yeah. two skirmishes, which is two of the existing maps with uh, some different objectives, essentially, thrown at you. See, these impressions are really speaking to me because you're, you're what you're praising is how varied and interesting and complex it is in just this demo. And that is totally my experience with Valkyria Chronicles 1, how varied the missions were, how they would make you deal with something on the fly that felt really fun and usually not all that frustrating. Uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was that, that create the creativity and the variety in those missions, but you're also really worrying me. Like I want to play this demo. You've got me hyped up. 
Uh, but it's also completely in Japanese, and so I have to wonder, do you feel like you're missing out on a lot? Do you feel like you had to fumble through it and it wasn't that much fun at certain points because you didn't understand? The or... only thing was uh, the, the tower code thing. Uh, I because I, it was explained in Japanese, so I was like, "What the hell are they talking about this sure. code thing?" Uh, after I think I streamed this, so chat was kind enough to let me bumble around that for a little bit what I was gonna to ask. see if I could figure it out on my own. Like, oh, even if he doesn't know Japanese, let's see if he figures it out. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I started getting a little I was like, "Man, this is way hard. like the difficulty spike got really high here. Am I missing something, chat?" And so I was like, "Hey, I watched another some and someone else's stream." You gotta shoot the towers. I'm like, oh, that's what that code is? It's like, yeah, it says in the Japanese. It's like completely, it's totally explained to you. It's not like cryptic or anything. You're just, because you don't know Japanese, you just missed that point. That's mm -hmm. why you're having such a difficult time. But that, other than that, no, like everything, I think it's because I had already played so much Valkyria Chronicles, and especially yeah. the first one. And that's a big point. Right down to the presentation of the, every element in that game, the notebook is back. Like the journal sure. um, with the flipping pages and everything. Like the little like bookmarks take you to the different options. You got the training field again, where you can train all your units and stuff. Um, they cap you at level four because your progress in this demo will carry over into the final version Ooh. of the Japanese game. But they level cap everything at four. You can't go above your units. Can't go above level four because sure. like oh you just grind out and keep getting experience. Um, upgrading the gear, like the weapons, you can get medals, earn better guns, because there were like the metal rewards in the original mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. um, tank parts, like all that's back. And that's why I think some people might be like, it's a little too similar, because like they literally took every element from yeah. Valkyrie 1 and brought it back. But it feels like they're showing that on purpose in the demo, because like, this is this demo literally has everything you were expecting out of Valkyria One to be a back. Sign of reassurance. And it's like you haven't even touched, scratched the surface of this game. Mm -hmm. Imagine what we have in store for you when you actually play the, like the final game. That's my perspective. I'm going into it with is that demo reassured me. I saw enough little morsels of like new elements. So I was like, okay, the, and I like them. And remembering how many chapters the original game was, like chapter two, that's nothing. We right. we got a long haul to go here. Uh, Brad, Damian was kind of going through the the history of Valkyria Chronicles, and it's it's been, you know, a strange history. You had the PS3 version, then you had the sequel on PSP, then you had the the one that didn't come out here, mm -hmm. and then you had this spinoff that no one asked for and wasn't well received. And so it, we've kind of been all over the map of Valkyria Chronicles, but Valkyria Chronicles Four is coming back. It's it's coming out on all these platforms. It's it's a sign of reassurance in some ways, as Damian was talking about. How likely do you think that this is going to be successful? Do you think this is just going to please the people that already like Valkyria Chronicles, or is this going to reach a bigger, wider audience? I think it'll reach a bigger, wider audience, especially because when one came out on PC, it did extremely well. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people didn't know about these games. A lot of people like me who have only played the first game... I played it when it first came out, too, so I've been really itching mm -hmm. for something like this. Like, I think there's a lot of people that play that game coming out, and they're going to come back, and they're going to spread goodwill. It's going to be one of those things that's going to spread by the word of mouth, I think, too. Yeah. Like, I think this game's going to do really good uh, cr uh, critically, especially what Damiani is saying to me. It's like, this is like this is what I want from this game. Yeah. I want, oh, yeah. I want it to be like one, but with some few new things. So, I think it's going to do really well, actually. I think this will be a good move for Sega. How many platforms is it on? So it's going to be on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, uh, and Switch, I don't, for, for, and PC, I think? It'll be on PC inevitably, I think. Uh, I forget if it's originally on there. It's definitely on PS4, Switch, coming to Switch, and Xbox One. Those three for sure. So it's on a I thought on the preview I put, I looked it up and PC was coming as well. Um, Switch is not, so it comes out this month in Japan, mm -hmm. except for Switch. Switch will be in quarter two in Japan, okay. so it's coming a little later. We still don't. We, we still don't have, have a. It's just confirmed for worldwide this year mm -hmm. in the West, but no actual release date for it yet. So it's yeah. gonna be staggered. I think this will do really well. I don't like. It reminds me, kind of, of a Monster Hunter World situation where mm. like this game that's been these games that people really loved is now getting a ton of attention. It was like Capcom's fast selling game of all time. I'm not saying it's gonna be anywhere close near that level, but I think right. this game will do probably better than they expect. Yeah, thinking about it, uh, you, you brought up Monster Hunter World, and I think you could also bring up Yakuza and Nier, and those yeah. are examples that we've commonly cited before. Um, and I think a lot of that is, we were talking about the newness of Twitch and YouTube, mm -hmm. and I think the tool that 
helps make these games bigger than they normally would be is now you have so many voices who are familiar with the series where they can a contextualize it tell you what this is and explain it and break mm-hmm. it down and there are also people who if you are feeling intimidated or you you're just new and you don't know there are so many voices who specialize in very specific content that can be like here's what you do if you want to do this here's what you do um and like you look at like monster hunter world and you look at like Gaijin Hunter and Eric's and what they're doing with games. And you, there are other games where they do that too, you know, Rainbow Six Siege or Destiny, whatever it is, where I think those creators, those content creators, are making these games a lot more digestible for people. And I think that's having an effect on sales. I think mm-hmm. that's having a, an effect on, on how these games are seen. And you're seeing other companies uh, pay attention to that mm-hmm. and invite those very specific focus creators over to press events and giving them early access uh, because yeah. I think they're becoming increasingly aware of that too. So I think that's interesting. Um, but Damiani, that was nothing but good news, man. Yeah, that was everything like, you, said. We watched was... the trailer and we had full on excitement, ready to go. This seems exactly what we want. And you're sitting here and basically reaffirming that. So I'm just itching to want to play more of it. And like I played the demo to death. Mm-hmm. Like as, as, as much as content was in there, it's just. Right. I need the final game, and I don't think I'm gonna bite on playing it in Japanese. Like through the compl- like, I I want to ha- enjoy the story sure. for this game, so I'm gonna hold off till the English version. It's just like, oh my gosh, please, just like, it, it, I just, like I just know I don't know if it's be good or not. I just know I want to play more of what I like got a taste of. At least your weight will be somewhat helped by Nino Kuni Two, which I also believe will probably be pretty good. We are hoping. Look at that smile. We're hoping. That's just anticipation. We're hoping. We're hoping. We don't know for sure, but we're hoping. <laughs> but if you go off the first one. And from what I've played of two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah that, that's always a good in care. I always want to say that it's not it's not the easiest thing, but it is there. In, you can present a game very nicely in a controlled demo environment to make mm-hmm. it seem like it's going to be a great game. That doesn't, only, that doesn't always guarantee it's going to be of a good game. Sure, they absolutely. might have picked like the best boss battle of Nino Kuni 2 for us to play at E3 last time. Right. It's like, yeah, we know this is the best one, but well, don't tell them. <laughs> yeah, just just playing four hours of it and getting a yeah. solid sense of the yeah, early story. You got to story, play more. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 I, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, this this four hours was strong. Yes, okay, four hours is a good amount of time. Yeah, yeah, this is four hours is a good amount of time. But yes, I yes, agree yes, with you. Yes, yes. E3 demos in particular can be. Deceptive, and those are E3 demos are the hardest to come and speak about because sometimes the demo is so good, or you're in the moment of excitement mm. with a big trailer or reveal. But a lot of these demos, it's like, okay, I've got to play it for 15 minutes in this very crowded space, and so, so you, you doubt yourself a little bit. Ben, yes, real quick. Great example of that. Yeah, Revengeance at E3. Oh, okay, I had the worst time with it at E3. Thought it was. Hot garbage. I don't know. <laughs> they give you like how did this ten happen? minutes. They won't even let you figure out how to play. Like they they took you through a room that like the Konami style tutorial. Like here's a video like boot camp style. I'm like okay, that's not gonna help me. I'm not gonna remember any of this. Let me play this and explain it to me. They threw me at it and I was trying to play. And there was a guy next to me the whole time. Like uh, well, you could do this. Uh, you could do that. Uh, yeah, you're not really doing it right. So I was like, you know- oh my god. Dude, you're not helping me at all. <laughs> you bring up a really good point. I was so angry. I was like, bye, your game sucks. The demo the demo attendant can really have a strong influence oh my God. on like I how the it. demo goes because they, they fall into like different buckets, yes. right? Because the first de- the good demo attendant, they'll like be patient with you, mm-hmm. they'll understand that you're learning. They will when it's like critical and it's like, okay, they're really not getting this, they'll come in and they'll help you. They'll offer additional context and so they'll come in and be like, Hey, this is what this means, or here's where you are. Like They'll just kind of, like, pay attention and watch. But then you have the bad ones. And the first type of bad demo attendant is the one that is, like, reassuring about everything. Where they're like, wow, you fast-forwarded through the text boxes. You're, like, so good at this. I haven't seen anybody at E3 (laughs) that's played this as well as you. And it's just, like, it's it's nice that you're being complimentary, but there are, like, people that go way too far with Uh. it. Where they will praise you for everything. And they're like, oh, my gosh, you got through that so fast. That's the worst. Or, like, the people who clearly have, like, a pitch they got to do, and they're just, like, cycling through it, and you're, yeah. you're like, uh, you're figuring it out, but they just keep talking, yeah. and they just need to, like, take a step back, and you're like, no, I, like, I got it. I know you, you're you just trying to do your job, but, <laughs> so yeah. True. Yeah. I, have an influence I really prefer when they don't talk to me at all unless I ask them a question. <laughs> That's when it's the best. Sure, 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 nice. sure. 
Don't look at me. Yeah. Don't look at me. Look away. Turn around. Uh, it's good that Valkyria Chronicles 4 was positive from, from what you played, Damiani. I've got something else that was really surprising me and that I'm very oh. excited to talk about. Uh, I played the the closed test. You get it for pre-ordering uh, Warhammer Vermintide 2. Uh, Tell me about it. Tell me about it, Ben. Yeah, so a um, little bit of context. Ian and I played the first Vermintide at GDC. Oh. Uh, we had an appointment, and we went and we played it together, and it was really fun. It was like, oh, hey, it's, it's like a fantasy Left for Dead, but my impressions didn't go beyond that. Uh, I purchased the game, but I just fell into backlog hell, and I didn't play it. Uh, but I was really curious about Vermintide 2. Uh, Huber was hyping it up. I was like, oh, man, I had a, a good initial experience with Vermintide 1. I'm going to boot it up, and I thought like I was just going to play it a little bit. It was right around lunchtime, and so I was like, oh, you know, I'll just play before lunch or Put whatever. around, yeah. Yeah. Um, I got sucked in and played way more than I mm-hmm. thought because I actually think it is quite good. And I think uh, saying it is a, a fantasy Warhammer like Left 4 Dead is a good starting point, but mm-hmm. there's more to it. There is there is so much promise from what I've seen in my initial goings of Warhammer it's like, 2. That's so That makes me so happy because I would be cool with it if it was just Warhammer Left 4 Dead. Like, yeah. that sounds fun to me as it is. Sure. But when you're telling me there's more, Ben? There's more, and it's it's not... It's not... What I like about it is it's not over-designed. Like, it's not too much. It's just a few little wrinkles here and there uh, that make it really interesting. And again, I, I'm coming from the perspective of having played very little Vermintide 1. Yeah. Um, but I, it's coming at the right time for me as well because I've been having, like, pangs for Left 4 Dead. Like, I, I've been thinking about Left 4 Dead periodically for the last few months, and, like, I was playing with my girlfriend a little bit, and I was like, I miss nice. this. Like, there's, there was more here. We needed more than two Left 4 Dead yeah. games. Where is this Where is this going? And it was, What's like, happening? a rapid pace we got one and two, and it just kind of left And then it forever. just fizzled just out. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of potential that was completely gone. Um, and all of the basic things that you appreciate about Left 4 Dead are present in Vermintide 2, and... I really want to emphasize how cool it feels and how good they are at evoking desperation. I think, in my experience, and I know I just read that they they tweaked the difficulty, but I was playing on Recruit. I was playing on the easiest setting. You will feel desperation and hopelessness like Excellent. immediately, and it pushes you. Like, I, the first map that I did, I was in this field... And just having, like, rats run through the field, you get completely swarmed, and you'll have, like, one of your teammates get drug away by this other rat, and you'll have, like, this 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 rat with, like, a Gatling gun shooting at you from the hill. A Gatling gun? Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's insane. What they'll, is this, they'll, they'll, be shooting, they'll be shooting gas at you. It's, you feel completely overwhelmed, and unlike Left 4 Dead, right, where your primary weapon is a gun, mm-hmm. here, your primary weapons are melee weapons. Um, and so the character that I spent the most amount of time with was the elf. And what I like about it is you get little RPG things that kind of modify your typical Left 4 Dead experience, uh, where like with the elf, I got double ammo capacity that ended up being really useful. And so like the Gatling gun guys, it was like, okay, I should take care of them because I have the most ammunition and I can like zoom in with my bow a little bit to headshot them. Okay. Really useful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also, with the elf, my health was regenerating. And let me tell you, in a game where you're surrounded and you have to deal with most things via melee, regenerating your health is extremely important. And so I felt very self-sufficient, but I felt like my ultimate, while good, like it just did a, a, a burst of damage, uh, was really good. But there were other people who, like the first guy I played, had this sword, and if you hit three enemies at once, your attack speed would increase. But his, his, like, gun wasn't great. Uh, it wasn't as fast as the bow. But his ultimate, it was like, okay, I'll give everybody a boost of temporary health. And you'll have those moments in Vermintide 2 so often where shit will just hit the fan and you want to scream at the person you're playing with, like, hey, pop that ult. Yeah. Uh, and because you're taking so much damage and because it's so intense all the time, like, you really want everybody to be on top of, of healing. And it's like... Hey, any potion that we find, like I know you want to be selfish and I know you want to take that for yourself, but give that to the guy who really needs it or heal the guy that uh, really needs it. I have a question. So, yeah. Ben, one of my favorite things in video games is when a mm-hmm. class or something feels super unique and important. Yes. Like, for example, when I when I used to play Final Fantasy XI back in the day, when I would get like a bard in my party, I was like, nice.
nice. Got yep. bard buffs. Do the classes feel like that? Do they feel yes. like when you see you have a certain person on your team, you're like, yes, I got this person. This will be good for this situation. Yeah. Um, there was there was always I didn't play as every single character, but I played at least with every single character, and it really felt like everybody had their own strengths and weaknesses. And because of those strengths, you were really happy that they were on your team. And because of those weaknesses, mm -hmm. uh, you had to work together. And I got that sense a lot. And uh, you also have character progression. You will be leveling up. You'll be getting new weapons. You'll be getting uh, different uh, talents, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so I like that as well, where you can really focus on a specific person. Unlike Left 4 Dead, where basically is everybody the same. Yeah, everybody's the same. It's like, like gun, yeah. hey, I want to play with Brad because he plays this character really well, and I know he's going to use his ult cool. at the right time. I know that he knows how to work around the weaknesses of his gun or whatever it is. And so I like that. I like that specialization. Is that different from the first one, then? That, 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 to that degree? So I don't remember. Okay. My, okay. I have, like, okay. the foggiest memories about Vermintide 1. Uh... And so I don't I don't remember like if there were classes I don't remember them feeling as distinct as Vermintide Two but I honestly don't remember. Gotcha. I ask because it seems to be like a trend with a lot of like the online squad based games right. is having those like roles and stuff of like being mm -hmm. unique enough and being very important that that that's like one of the key ingredients for being you know successful. Yeah. So it sounded like they were following the trend, which is like you know good like that. It, what you're describing sounds very interesting to the point that I was like, huh. I, I like this is probably gonna be big when it comes out. Like right. it, it's it's this good of a vibe behind it. Yeah, and you're right. It is a it is a trend uh, with a lot of these these types of survival games. Uh, but I find that sometimes what prevents me from because there are so many like. Any given month, it feels like you can go on Steam and there's like something rising to the top of the bestseller list that is some sort of survival type of thing. But what prevents me from getting too far deep into them is talking about that over design element where it's like, okay, you have all you have these all these layers that you need to understand before you can really appreciate the game. And what I like about Vermintide 2 is that stuff is there. Yes, you're gonna get different weapons, yes your character is going to progress, yes you have the sense of ownership. But on a fundamental level, it's like, hey dude, survive. And so that stuff that like those stats and those talents and all of that stuff, it's not too much. It gives it enough to keep it interesting and keep, to keep you wanting to come back. Uh, okay. But it's not so much that I felt like I had to penetrate this layer mm. just to get in and enjoy yeah, the right. game so that, and that feel that intensity. Great. So yeah. that sounds really good. I hate it when games... I get what they're trying to do. They're yeah. trying to work up to this like the the, the, the deeper levels of the, the systems that you got to understand because they have like the better payoffs. So like it, right. the quote-unquote getting to the end game or what's going to keep you coming back for more. I hate it when they put their entire stake into that. Like the, the entire gamble is the player's going to get to that point. Right. And the early game suffers so much for that. Right. I just wish more games would do what you're like what you're describing with Vermintide here is that no, you get immediate payoff with that. Like you, you, you it's hitting you with what it's trying to do and it's not hitting you with the wrong overly complicated stuff initially but right. it is gonna be there right. you're gonna get this enjoyment you're gonna keep playing it and it sounds like you're gonna naturally work up to that because they already did its job of keeping you there to play it which feels so many games fail to do that and they, they just don't have that you know nearsightedness they're just too yeah. you know long like they're playing the long game right exactly I, I think I think the core has to be there and sometimes I get this sense that because um, you know, let's say a particular genre may be oversaturated, that they, they need to stuff more complexity in there in order to stand out from the crowd. Um, I get that sense sometimes, but in Vermintide 2, you, you strip away all of that progression, all of that other stuff. It's still kind of exhilarating to be in there, to fight this giant menace, and to have, like, the, the, the voices be like, Hey, you have, to, you have to hit the head to take this down! Or to see, like, a sea of green flame. Like, there's just kind of this visceral immediacy with Vermintide, much like Left 4 Dead, the first time that you experienced it, and that the tank came in, and you oh heard that God. music, <laughs> like, brum, brum, brum. <laughs> like it was just exciting to play on a very basic level, and I think Vermintide Two uh, captures that. I do want to say so. There are tank enemies. Okay. Um, there, are, there are big, giant. Hey, they've got a health bar type of thing that you need to take down. And again, I was playing on recruit. I was playing on the easiest difficulty. These things, like every single time I encountered them, 
w- would either wipe us out completely, to, like deplete all of our ammo. They, they they took forever to take down, but it was kind of exciting. They felt like even more of an event than like a tank in Left 4 Dead. It was like a huge Sweet. moment, and because you didn't necessarily know when it was going to appear, that excitement uh, kind of carried through throughout the session as well. So are you pretty much uh, like dwarf elf human in this? Can you be the orcs? Chaos? Um, no, you're you're. I believe it's two humans. Yeah, it's two humans. I believe an elf and a dwarf okay. are the the classes that I saw. Gotcha. The characters that I saw. Um, but yeah, it's very very good. There were some performance issues that I saw. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's hard to tell if that was com- on my end or if that was the game, but there would definitely be times, especially when things got extremely chaotic, where I'd be playing like around sixty most most of the time, and then it would just zip to Dude. thirty for a brief moment and then pop okay. back up. But yeah. Uh, I'm excited to dig into to more of it to have a better understanding of it once it releases. Um, Me too. But mm. very, very strong first impressions right now for Vermintide. Uh, Brad, Huber, Damiani, like, this is something, this is a game the allies should play together. Oh, I I'm playing. I think it'd be fun. Yeah, I think you've convinced me. Okay. I'm down. Yeah. Um, I won't be here Friday for the stream. I can't, won't be able to join you. Yeah, we're doing it Thursday, Thursday, I think. I, Thursday. I'm out Wednesday through Friday okay. this week. But there's, there a, re- other... there's a, re- a return engagement. Yeah. I'll be happy to join. Yeah. I think uh, Brandon would like it as well. I do. I think he'd like it. Brad, uh, last episode, I kind of aired my grievances with the Secret of Mono remake, but you played a lot more than I did. Played, played all the of whole it. thing. Ooh. And what do you think? Uh, Mixed bag. Okay. Mixed bag, good and bad kind of thing. Are those, are those, how much is the good and badness tied to the remake and how much of it is tied so, to Secret of Mana itself? Some of it's tied to the original Secret of Mana, like, but the thing about the remake is it feels like a missed opportunity in a lot of ways to fix problems that the first one had mm-hmm. or to like try to trump it. I don't think this version is necessarily better than the original one. Like, I would be hard for me to, like... I would recommend, for example, to you, Ben, Mm -hmm. to play the original version, because I think it would click with you more. Because the original version, it has a certain vibe to it that gets kind of lost in the remake. It could be the art style. Like, that's a big part of it. Like, Mm -hmm. the art style doesn't really bother me that much, but I know it bothers a lot of people. Yeah. But something is kind of lost in that transition where it doesn't feel quite right. Mm. But, for example, like, the remake, there's some things I like, they have kind of cutscenes now that can be done because it's like more 3D kind of going on, which yeah. is cool. And there's some moments between the main characters when they're in inns just talking, but it's not really that substantial. Right. But it's just like a cool little thing that you can get to get to know the characters a little more. But like that's about they add also two hockeys for magic. And that's about it. That seems that seems really useful. It seems good. It's it's like it is nice, but it's like Mm-hmm. There should be more. I feel like this this remake should have a little more. It doesn't feel like a remake that they gave. I'm not saying they didn't give enough attention to it, but it, it felt like a missed opportunity to me. Like, it's fine. Yeah, but I kind of expected a little more from a full-blown remake. So playing the original and now going through the remake, uh, what, how would you, Bradley Ellis, as somebody who's le- steering the ship, what would you like to see improved specifically for a revisit to Secret of Mana? So... I feel like the boss battles, especially, and like some of the the ramped up difficulty, is really weird. Because some of the bosses, I feel like, are kind of impossible without magic. It feels really weird. Like mm-hmm. I feel like when I was playing this game, like, hey, I really need to grind out magic yeah. to get past this, and it kind of sucks. It's not really that fun. Like yeah. I get it. Like older RPGs were kind of like, yeah, you got to grind a little bit. But the process of doing it wasn't rewarding or fun to me, like at all. I found myself just kind of bored. A lot of the like the encounters aren't that fun. Like the boss battles, like you know, when you do a boss battle, like hey, you got this like mechanic you got to pay attention to. There's only a couple where you got to deal with something different, but they're not that great. Mm. They're just kind of like attack that spot and then that spot and that spot. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. So uh, 
going very, very, very slowly, like the last couple of months chipping away at the original Secret mm-hmm. of Mana, I've definitely hit that point as well, or at least in the area that I'm in, kind of like this spot, it feels like, hey, every single boss, the most efficient, best, safest thing for me to do is just to spam magic and until this thing is it, dead. And it's like, that's not how it feels like, that's what it is. Right. And that's, you know, th- those encounters, not that memorable as a result, but do you think as a remake... They should go in and retool that, or is there an it's obligation? Like, I don't to know. Kind it's like it this is same. your chance to like kind of change it a little bit. Mm. I think this was the chance. I, like I could get the idea where they're like, "Hey, we want to keep it super faithful to the original." Like I totally get that. That works in some cases, mm-hmm. in ca- like Shadow Claws, like that works. But I feel like you could have fixed some things. Mm-hmm. That's what I just really feel like. Kind of just a, a little more to make it better. Um, beyond the boss fights, you're talking about them needing to do a little bit more. Are mm-hmm. there other things that come to mind that you would have liked to see them? Ugh, just like the story of this game is pretty boring, dude. Mm. I'm not going to lie. I was pretty bored going through all of this. There's moment. A lot of it is not interesting. I don't is it think, just too simplistic for you? It's just like it's barely there. Mm. The, like The story is barely there. Mm-hmm. There's like bosses, kind of like enemies, but you're just like, who's this? Oh, they're gone. That's it. I'm like, who's this guy? Oh, he's gone. It doesn't matter. I agree with you. Um, I, I think for the most part, I've found the story just kind of in the background. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I do like is it's mostly out of the way. Uh, yeah, see, I'm, like, it's, I, a, it's a double-edged sword because that right. can be good. Right. But at the same time, it's, it can be bad. In a lot of cases, I found myself, like, having not a lot of motivation sure. to keep going. I understand that. I, I think... Having a stronger jo- uh, story increases your desire to play, but at the same time, it's like, okay, if they did go in and try to add more story, I don't just want to sit there listening to yes. like the same level of quality, just more of it. And I think, you know, that is that is a problem that a lot of RPGs are suffering, where they just don't know when to shut up, where they yeah. oh, they yeah. just they what they're doing is extremely basic and they just keep going on and on and on and so i would rather have it be like not that great but kind of in the background uh versus not that great and oh my god there's way too much of it yeah it's just like the story of this game a lot of the payoff i guess doesn't come till the end of the game mm-hmm. and it's super like fast mm-hmm. i'm just like what the hell just happened that's it like the ending was like super done the bo- Ugh, the last boss fight was so st- so bad, dude. Hmm. Terrible ass boss fight. What made it so <sighs> bad? Because so for this boss fight, you need to have you can only attack it by having Prim and Popoy cast magic on you so you can hit it. And this buff you put in weapon doesn't last that long, so you gotta wait for. And the boss comes in like phases. He'll fly away, shoot fire at you. Nothing you can really do. You just gotta take the hit. Mm-hmm. Then you wait for it to land. Then it just keeps repeating like that. I'm just like, dude, this is so boring man mm. why did it have to have this weird mechanic where it just flies away and i can't do anything i'm just sitting here getting hit and i gotta wait for it to come back it's like i'm here gone you just gotta wait for it you gotta wait a little bit it's just really annoying and frustrating just like kind of all the bosses of the game like a lot of them are simple but it's just like it's not that fun i wasn't having a lot of fun doing it man like yeah I'm, so I love... it sounds like what you're saying is that the charm of the original, some of that has been lost, but a lot of your issues, a lot of the frustrations, you think are kind of yeah. present in Secret like, of Mana I overall. noticed this when I was playing through the original version, too. Like, I was mm-hmm. just kind of like, hmm, I don't think I like this game as much as everyone else kind of thing. Sure. Because it was just like a lot of little things just adding up when I was playing this game. Just a little here, my kid's kind of annoying. That's kind of annoying. That's kind of annoying. That's kind of annoying. I wasn't like freaking out during it like just something like terrible yeah but just like a little things chipping away at me as i was playing through this game mm-hmm. uh the m- one of the problems is because i played all- most of it by myself because this game is way more fun and enjoyable if you have friends to play with you it's because the ai in this game is it's not good it's pretty bad dude like yeah. party members dying a lot just not moving, getting stuck behind walls, and I'd have to go back and get them or switch over to them. Yeah, I noticed in the remake they definitely still got stuck, but something I appreciated at the very least is, like, your... In the original, you couldn't get that far away from them. Like, if they were yes. if they were stuck behind something, you couldn't keep going. Here they let you go much farther, mm-hmm. uh, and so you're not you're not quite as tightly tethered. Not as quite as tightly tethered, like but it's just like... This game is, like, 25 years later, I think. Mm-hmm. Like, could have just tightened it up a little bit 
a little more tightness on some stuff. So you're saying they didn't do enough? They didn't. I feel like they didn't do enough. Hmm. It didn't feel like full attention yeah. kind of thing. It's always interesting uh, playing a remake of a game that you know is very highly regarded. Yes. Um, it's always interesting playing something for the first time that you know is very highly regarded. Uh, Damiani, what is your experience with Secret of Mana? Uh, I played up to the point in the original Super Nintendo version where you fall down the waterfall and you get the blade. That's the very beginning of the game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> there you go, Brad. And that is my experience <laughs> okay. with Secret of Mana. So okay. I have to ask... Was there a particular reason you stopped? Uh, one, I wasn't. The story wasn't drawing me in, even at that early point. Uh, compared to other RPGs I was playing on Super Nintendo at the time, just like okay, I'm not. Well, Final Fantasy IV, I got really hooked with this like Kane and Cecil getting like excommunicated from Baron, and they gotta go deliver this package. Just like this is kind of cool. Like this King just tossed them out, but these two like cool buds are going on a journey here. Uh. Yeah, even six, the march on Narsh at the beginning, the mm-hmm. assault on Narsh, like, this is really awesome and stuff, which is after. I was like, okay, I'm down with this. Like, Chrono Trigger, like, Super Mario, everything else had, like, an intro that kind of, like, drew me in much, like, more effectively, more effectively mm-hmm. than Secret of Mana. The other thing that really was getting on my nerves was the, the, the battle system mechanics. Uh, I'm not, it's not my prefer. it's not, I'm not saying sure. it's bad. Yeah, 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 I just don't like that style. Mm. And uh, the more I play it, I was like, I, I really don't want to play this. I, I'd rather go back to s- traditional turn-based battle systems at the time. And I, I just kind of gave up on it. I was like, the story's not doing it for me. It looked gorgeous, though. I love the music, and I loved how it looked. Mm-hmm. I just, the, the, the battle system and, and the story just wasn't doing it for me. I was like, I'm going to walk away from this, because I'm not going to spend, like, at the time, like these games are like 30, 40 hours. I don't know. I'm, I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. yeah. Um, this version does address some things. Like it tries to address the AI of like your characters. Like you can now have them attack different enemies than you if you want, or they can do like charge attacks. But it's like a lot of that just doesn't really feel like it mattered when I was playing. Hmm. Like it just doesn't even matter when I'm going through this. Like for instance, the magic, like the hockeys, it's like. Yeah, I have all this magic with, like, Prim, for example. Yeah. But it's like, hey, 90% of the time of the game, I just had heal. Uh, uh, hot keyed on it. Mm-hmm. It's like nothing else, like, really mattered when I was playing. It was super weird. I'm like, I have all this stuff, but I don't need to use any of it. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think on a fundamental level, I, I still have a lot of respect and get a lot of satisfaction from the core combat of Secret yes. of Mana. Uh, I really love the idea of having to wait until a meter th- builds up or to choose to use charge attacks to get a big hit on a guy. And I think it was really good. Like the original Secret of Mana, in my experience so far, is really good at giving you feedback, like hitting an enemy, the sound that it makes, saying, seeing that it got thwacked. Like all of that was really fun. Hitting something, choosing to run away, be having to be very conscious of space. I thought all of that was good. I very much agree with you um, on the AI being frustrating a lot of times. I very much agree with that. And... The bosses just spamming magic to get rid of them. That hasn't been very there's fun. There's no more thwack either. Yeah, there's no more thwack in the remake, which is very upsetting. Uh, but the other thing with the bosses beyond the magic spamming is sometimes I think Secret of Mana is bad at communicating information where, like, you try to hit something and you can't tell that you missed it because of the things like evasion or... Or if you just actually Dude, missed it. What if I tell you that just gets worse as the game goes on? That's like, not enemies encouraging. just start having way yeah. more evasion. So, like, this happened to me a lot when I was attacking or I was charging up attack, doing a charge attack ban. And you can get mm-hmm. different levels as your levels or your weapons level up. So, I'm like, charge four, ready to go, get this guy. And, like, one of my AI partners hits him as I'm about to unleash it. And I do it and it doesn't do any damage because enemies have, like, a cooldown period when you hit them. It takes a second. You can't hit them right after to do damage right after that. You have to go wait a specific second. So I'd hit guys, and it just wouldn't do anything. Hmm. I'm just like, dude, why, why are you doing this, man? Just let me right. hit it. Yeah, I, I've had a couple of moments in Secret of Mana where, where something will happen. I'll be like, why did that happen? And then I'll go, and I'll look it up, and I'll be like, oh, okay, that's why that happened. But just within the game itself, sometimes that information isn't as clear. Yeah, as I, like, I, like it I sound like I'm being super hard on this game. Yeah. I do like this game. I think it's fun to play through and go, yeah. especially if you have friends like it, but I just have, there's just a lot of little nitpicks I have with it, especially the remake. I 
I feel like there could have been more. To bring it to a modern standard for JRPGs that we could, like, to bring it to a modern standard. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like they should have been able to do with this game, and they just didn't. Yeah, um, it's interesting because I, I do think your forgiveness of things is comes down to how familiar you are with them. So, like, if you and I had finished Secret of Mana five times mm -hmm. and loved it to pieces as children, I wonder if our complaints would be as strong as they are now. And I, I am curious for people that, that are at that point mm -hmm. with Secret of Mana, where they know it inside and out, how they feel about the remake and how they feel about yeah. the changes that like, have happened. Yeah. If you have two other buddies with you and you guys play this game, you're going to have a fun time. I still have not played any Secret of Mana co-op. I've just played that's, with the AI. That's the way to play this game. Sure. Like, I would recommend that the most of everything if you can. Sure. Uh, Damiani, yes. I have some news for you. Oh. I yeah. was Brad one last question about Secret of Mana. Please. Because I might have to correct myself. Uh, is that sword part before or after you fight the rolling tiger boss thing? Oh, that's before. The, the, the sword, sword thing is like the where first thing. That's okay. the first thing. I might, I might be remembering the rolling tiger boss, rolling tiger is, boss like is where the I, second or third boss. Yeah, that's where I gave up. Okay. Hmm. Like I, I tried twice to beat it, and I was like, okay, I'm done. I feel like this game isn't as hard as the original. I feel like the original was a little more annoying, too. I feel like mm -hmm. they maybe toned down the difficulty. Uh, one good thing I will say about this game is I feel like the hitboxes are better on enemies now. Mm -hmm. For example, there's a wall enemy, like a like a, a demon wall kind of thing. It's like okay. two eyes on a wall and like an eye in the middle. Like I remember in the original one, I'd just swing at it, be perfectly lined up, and wouldn't yes. do anything. Well, that, was a, that was the evasion thing that I was talking about. I know exactly. But I'm just, I, yeah, I was getting yeah. like, I'm like, dude, just let me hit this guy. Uh, yeah. Especially yeah. when you got to charge up to wait to attack again. When you're like going for 30 seconds and not hitting a guy, it's just mm -hmm. kind of annoying. But they, I think they fixed that a little more with some bosses. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. No, don't me. be sorry. I've got some news for you. Uh, yeah. So we, we talk about the demons of the frame trap. And if you're unfamiliar with this little weird part of the show, uh, Somebody will say a phrase or a word that will will trigger these demons and it will put us into a game that we have to play. And the the two panelists will compete amongst themselves to uh, to try to get out of the game. And I think we have a pretty fun one today. Uh, but Damiani, they usually like to pick words that annoy them or that they think are completely ridiculous. They're feeling pretty chill today. Mm. And oh, uh, nice. you happen to say a word that is like kind of just gelling with the demon's <laughs> vibe right now. You All say right. cool buds. Cool buds. Cool buds. Cool buds. Cool buds is what, what triggered it today. Uh, the game that we're going to be playing is Weird License Games. This is going to be another oh, iteration yes. of Real or Fake. Nice. And so you're going to have to tell me if this is an actual video game that happened using this license, this weird <laughs> license, oh, wow. or if I made it up. Cool. And so the way that it's going to work is whichever panelist whispers Hotake into the mic first gets to answer. Gotcha. Now, we're following with the same rule that we did last time, that we hammered out last time. Because there are only two options, the stakes are extra high. If you get it wrong, the point goes to the other person. Whoa. Oh, yeah, so you better nice. think about it. I know it's a 50-50, but you better really think about it because Understood. your incorrect answer has consequences. Of course, this is also the time where we're going to get a little help in this demon dimension from our sponsors. Hmm, We've got nice. some sponsors to talk about today. Our first one is from the ever cool Greg, the Dark Knight Kettering. Thank you, Greg, so much for your support. Our second one is Zen Market. It's a Japanese shopping proxy service, which means that for only 300 yen per item, that's less than $3, you can buy games, anime, merch, and more directly from Japanese online stores. You can even bid in real time on Yahoo Auctions if you are looking for rare or used items. Plus, it's easy to buy things from multiple stores and consolidate them for free into one box before you ship them home. Sign up today and get a 300 yen bonus you can use toward your first purchase. It's easy to manage everything from shopping to shipping right from your account on Zen Market's website. Don't pay more than you have to for that sweet Japanese booty. <laughs> and helpful staff are always waiting to guide you on your journey should you need assistance. Find Zen Market on social media or, go to, or just go to zenmarket.jp and check it out for yourself. Our next sponsor is Taker34. And he's got a quiz for you. Oh. Mm. What are games called that don't have a single loot box in them? Good video games. Damiani, you have an answer? Don't have a single loot box. A video game. Cancelled! Oh! oh! 
we played that uh, we played that joke on the last episode as That's well. That's funny. And, and Kyle and Huber got a, mm-hmm. a kick out of it. That's good. <laughs> Make sure to not follow at Taker Thirty Four X on Twitter unless you're currently working on a new Legacy of Kane game. Oh, okay. Ah. Fourth sponsor is KG Two Entertainment dot com. Their apps are little nuggets that will challenge the H-E double hockey sticks out of you. (laughs) You thought Flappy Birds was challenging. Mm -hmm. He was the daddy. Now meet the sons. Last but certainly not least, we have a game that we're sponsoring. Oh. Schemata is a fast-paced mobile puzzle game based on digital logic diagrams developed by Friendly Fish Games. Race through logic circuits while organically learning how they work. The game is free with ads and has a $2 option to disable them. No other microtransactions are in the game. Out now on the Google Play Store and coming soon to iOS. Find out more at schematagame.com. Sweet. All right. Real or fake, real license games. Okay. Are we ready? We've got five yes. of them this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's hear it. First one. Home Improvement Power Tool Pursuit. Oh, die. Brad. Real. That is real. Yeah. That is Super it. Nintendo there was game, a, there dude. Was a, I played it. Yep. It <laughs> wow. was a Super Nintendo game. There's an action platformer on Super Nintendo. It sucks. Yikes. Based on home improvement. Yeah, you're like fighting dinosaurs in it. I was like, what the hell's going on here, man? I just want to make tool. I just want to build like a birdhouse with Al or something. Oh, my gosh. Uh? Murder. My parents love Jeez. home improvement. They love it. My, my, it. my dad is Tim Allen. Uh, like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good because he would like show me like a power tool or something. Like, ha, 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 ha. So it was super <laughs> funny. <laughs> uh, the Brad lore, it's like falling into place. Everything's it's, making like slightly it's, more it's sense. Good Tim Allen. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Okay, uh, so just to clarify, this is based on the movie. White Men Can't Jump. Was there a video game based on the movie with Wesley Snipes and Woody Allen, White Men Can't Hotake, Jump? Hotake, yes. I thought it was for, like, Genesis. Yeah. Correct. That sounds right, yeah. There is, there is like actually... Like a 32X game or something. A lot of these... By the way, I just want to clarify, as I was doing research for this, a lot of these in the description are like, this is commonly referred to as one of the worst games ever made. Yes. Uh, actually, White Men Can't Jump it came out in 1995 on the Atari Jaguar. Okay. Ew. But it is a real game. No, it wasn't Nintendo, yeah. Ew. Yeah, Atari Jaguar. And it was a PlayStation. I was like, yeah, Not Sega. that Nintendo. It's, like, it's either Sega or... Seal of quality. Yeah. We should stream it. Yeah. All right. That'd be pretty fun. Maybe. Send us Does Jones have a Jaguar? Yeah, but it's broken. <laughs> oh, that stinks. We've got one point each for both of our contestants today. Number three, in sync, get to the show. Oh, in sync, get to the show, dude. That sounds like a Game Boy Color game. <laughs> <laughs> like a PlayStation 1 game. <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. Dude. What if we both don't say anything? Then neither of you get a point. Uh, uh, this seems pretty risky, dude. You can't. Come on. You can somebody <laughs> okay, Hitake, fake. That's real. Okay. Brad was right. Oh. In sync, get to the show on Game Boy Color. Yeah. 2001. <laughs> 2001. Uh, apparently, apparently, it's like some sort of mini game collection oh, where at the end no. you're rewarded with a performance no. by In Sync. So that's that's a thing. Fourth one, Can't second be, to last. Yeah. Tommy Boy back on the road. Oh my gosh. Hotake? Yeah. Fake. That's fake. Yeah, uh, no, no way, dude. I don't know about Chris Farley game. Would that be sick, no. Yeah, that'd be sick. <laughs> Tommy oh. Boy back on the road is Can not Can you imagine if they made like a, a black sheep game, game and one of the levels yes. is you just falling down the hill? <laughs> oh my god. You gotta rack up points. Yeah, it'd be Chris so Farley good. Rolling down. Our final one. Wild Wild West, the Steel Assassin. The Steel Assassin, dude? I don't remember. God! Uh, yeah, I don't remember if there was a Wild Wild West game. Yeah, I don't either. And the movie is bad, but it was a big deal, so they probably made a game of some sort. I don't know. Damiani. Uh, here, I'll take, I'll, I'll guess Damiani since you did the other one. Uh-huh. I'll say, oh, okay. I'll say, yes, this is real. It is real. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> it came out in 1999 on PC action oh, adventure PC. game. <laughs> Adventure, dude. <laughs> Look a wow, wow. Yeah, I got no as a theme song. Today. Look a wow, wow. I have knowledge about dumb video games for some reason. Good job. 
I was really hoping somebody would say Tommy Boy Back on the Road was real. Yeah, there's only one fake one this time. The rest were all that real. Like In Sync, a... Wild Wild West, Why Men Can't Jump, and Home Improvement. Dude, that real. sounds like a good or, arcade or, game, or, maybe, too, where it's like Crazy Taxi, but Tommy yeah, Boy. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, all right, anyway, uh, Brad, you crushed that one. Three points to one. Mm. Because you won, you have the privilege. We can't forget. We forgot, actually, one time to have... Somebody break us out of the frame trap dimension. We can't have that happen again. So, what are you going to do? What phrase, what gesture, what action are you going to do to get us out of this demon dimension? Uh, I've watched a lot of Dragon Ball. Okay. I know this one. Yeah. This is my boy Damiani, too. I know one of the character he loves does this move, dude, so I'm going to do it, too. Got to stand up. I've been charging for five minutes, Damiani. <laughs> Special beam cannon! Damiani... Uh, that was very good, Brad. Damiani, is Piccolo your favorite character? Because that would, that, like, I would love it if that was true. So Piccolo is awesome. Yes. In OG Dragon Ball. Yes. And through the first arc, uh, the Raditz saga arc, whatever, Saiyan arc. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is, stretches beyond Piccolo, it's long problem like long list of problems starting to have a dragon ball z yeah the repetitive formulaic nature of like every single like arc now and it's just getting ridiculous uh piccolo is serving this purpose in that formula and i'm not liking what they're doing with his character so much in dragon ball z there's sure. some parts i like um so but yeah and it's uh, like i i like i probably would say he is my favorite character in the show Nice. I hope they continue to further develop him. I know, uh, as far as and deep down, I don't believe he's ever going to be like the strongest or anything like that. He's going to be like always going to be like the tier below now Vegeta and Goku. It's going to be like Vegeta, mm -hmm. Goku, and it'll be, always be Piccolo like right behind them. He falls into this like, hey, we want you around, like come to the fight, but you're not nearly yeah. as useful and you're not going to be nearly as yeah, but as like the others. he's but, always in the mix, man. But, oh, absolutely, oh, always I in the love, mix. I love Piccolo. OG Dragon Ball, so good. Yeah, like loved his character arc, and then how he's like. Warming up and becoming like part of the good guy team, yeah. oh my and God. everything he does with Gohan, like that is like the only redeeming thing I Him like about training that is, Gohan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's Amazing. one of my favorite yeah. things about Pickle. It could be my is his relationship with Gohan. How he's kind of like Gohan's second dad, man. And Gohan like wears the the Namekian outfit and everything like that, dude. I don't know how far you are, but dude, it's so good. Yeah, like Gohan emulates him. It's yeah, so good. It's like so cool. I, forget, I think it's like yeah, I forget who says it. It's like wow, you really look up to him because you're literally wearing the same outfit as Piccolo. Yeah, he wears your shoulder dad. pads. I think dude. we're yeah, so I think we're cool. getting to a point on Frame Trap where you can just like expect a mini like little editorial on Dragon Ball, like with every episode, with every panel, <laughs> with it's almost a, every. It's panel. a constant thing in our life. It I is. feel like. It, well, it's a very it's a very intense thing in our lives right now also it's hilarious so, like, that like i don't know 90 percent of the english terms for any of the moves and stuff mm, like, yeah, yeah, everything yeah. to me is like saying in japanese like when i was trying people were like oh how do you like dragon ball and stuff on the stream and i was explaining it so i was like uh oh well, i like this and i was like what's it called in english i was like i was like i i mean i know the uh, the genki dama is the spirit bomb i was mm -hmm. like but i know i was like i don't you say spirit bomb especially <laughs> after i read the the kind of etymology behind it like spirit bomb is actually incredibly wrong <laughs> for the intent of what the move is hmm. uh but for the purpose of english it's just like very memorable terms so yeah it's, it's fine but yeah just like the, even like i don't call it nimbus the cloud like I was like people say that i'm like what quinto quinto, quinto yeah oh i love that dude quinto so good but uh, yeah, some of the other stuff is just like, uh, I see it in English, like, wait, what's that again? Yeah, dude, my favorite move is Vegeta's Big Bang Attack. I forgot what it's called in Japanese. It's the best move, dude. Where he does the one-handed shot. Oh, yeah. Oh, love it. They got some good good terms in there. Like, uh, what's uh, Gohan's is Masako or whatever. Yeah, Masako. Yeah. Masako, yeah. yeah, Masako, yeah. Uh, Masako. Good. Yeah, like, I don't call him Krillin. Korean. Korean. How do they say it? Yeah. Korean. Uh, I mentioned this on the weekly hunt stream, but there is there's a moment they're getting ready for a tournament. Tournament, and the the bit that happens with Android and Goku and Krillin <coughs> as they're getting ready for the tournament in Super has been top notch. <laughs> Not there's, I've had many disappointments with Dragon Ball Super, but there, there are times when it hits, and when it hits, it hits hard, and I like that a lot. Nice. Uh, Damiani, coming back to games here, 
you sometimes like Kyle will say something I'm like I don't even know what that game is uh, but I very much know what this game is I just have no idea why you're playing it uh, <laughs> Final Fantasy 11 not that like I'm mad that you're playing it I'm just I just Dominic, don't know why I'm happy you're playing it yeah it's not that I love that you presented that pen because in my mind I was visualizing as like Ben doesn't know what Final Fantasy 11 is Kyle said there's this game called Final Fantasy XI and Ben's like what? No, no, no. Didn't, no, I know but yeah. like, it's just fun it's like imagining Ben like yo there's, there's a, Final Fantasy XI there's a Final Fantasy game this I is like the know. old lost Final Fantasy game I thought they went from 10 to 12 yeah, no, what was no, this? I've, I've played nah, uh, a good chunk of Final Fantasy XI um, and enjoyed it uh, and have revisited it se- revisited it several times since its heyday. But you're playing it right now. You told me before the, the podcast that you played it for eight hours. Yep. What? Why? What, what happened? Hold on. What nation did you start at? Uh, uh, Sandoria. Hell yeah. That's where I started too. Can't start anywhere else. I just can't. It doesn't work. No, what's jolly the name? Ass doesn't forced. work like what? No, no, no. What's stock? No, no, we no, stock no. and Winders and Winders. then Winders is my favorite. Yeah, you can't start in Juno, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Winders later on. Yeah. That's the yeah. Good Juno, stuff. yeah, dude. But Sindoria, you're starting in Sindoria. Yes. How did this come about? What okay. what motivated you? So here's the story <laughs> that I was saving for this. Playing so picking up 14 again a little bit, and I was just like, I was watching. I was on the 14 subreddit, and I was reading a bunch of stuff. And I decided to finally click on this, uh, I forget their YouTube channel, I apologize. Uh, they did uh, a documentary on the history of Final Fantasy XIV before the Noclip one. Oh. Mm. Uh, like, Noclip one happened, like, r- like shortly after theirs. And they went on to start doing a series called, like, Remnants of a Realm, where they go back to the 1.0 zones to shady means. We'll just say that. You know, the game 1.0 mm-hmm. is no longer available, so <laughs> they're still getting footage of going through the zones that, you know, from the original version. They're showing what uh, defunct zones that didn't carry over after the Calamity. Because there's an RP reason for why Final Fantasy XIV went from oh, 1.0 to Bahamut. 2.0. Yeah, the, 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 the Calamity was Bahamut unleashing his fury, Dalmud, the moon crashing, blah, blah, blah. A lot of the land got ravaged, and so zones got completely destroyed. That were in 1.0 uh, and are no longer in 2.0, or zones that are still in 2.0 and the Realm Reborn and onward got dramatically changed, mm-hmm. and that's what the series is about: is how those zone, how the zones change, and features that uh, they do a cool thing on the sidebar about features of uh, this is still here. You can still see it if you go here. It was in 1.0 onward, hmm. or it's gone. It's defunct. Like it, it got destroyed, so you cannot see it anymore. Anyway, I was watching this series. I was like, man. I would really like to go back because uh, I reviewed Final Fantasy 1.0 uh, back at Game Trailers. I remember that review, dummy. Uh, I will, it was an experience. I will never forget this part in your review. You're talking about like the pitter patter characters yes, make when they're running. Um, <laughs> pitter patter. It doesn't happen very often. Once in a very great while. But if you can find it, I recommend. And it's not that hard to find. Go on YouTube, find the 1.0 Final Fantasy 14 review because in the script you can hear the reviewer's soul being crushed. Where it's like you can't even help. How just like utterly destroyed you are that this thing exists. It is just like I mean, you can, like I, you can I, sense I had the no anger. interest in playing it, honestly. Like yeah. it was just a side to me to review. Yeah. I was like, okay. I was like, I'm not really into MMOs, so here we go. And I played it, I was like, I think this is really bad. Can some <laughs> can some of you guys come over here and like just double check this? Like, this is really bad, right? And they're like they're like, yo, like people ask so they don't have this. No, they don't have they don't have an, they don't have any kind of like market board. You gotta go talk to all the different NPC mules in a large room. You can't even search for an item from them. You gotta manually talk with them and then manually view their wares. What? Post Wower? What? You teleport currency runs out and it takes the how long to regenerate? You uh, like the zones are copy pasta designed. Like the black shroud back in the day was like this infamous notorious maze. Easy to get lost because it's like the same like three different like types of like turns copied over and over again you'd zoom out on the map and it was just like the stuff of nightmares in terms of those like impossible mazes anyway yes i reviewed 1.0 and now having played through 14 and stuff and then watching the series it just triggered this thought in my head like i'd kind of like to go back and revisit 1.0 now with a different perspective having seen what 14 has done now i'd like to see you know 
how I feel about 1.0 again. Mm -hmm. Like, has, has anything about it? My mind changed because all I can go on is just my memories of it because you can't play it anymore. So I started searching around the internet to find if there's any, like, unofficial legacy server projects. So, you know, those are always going around. Uh, there was one that was... There is one being worked on still, but there was one you could technically access that I think shut down a year or two ago. And so there isn't one you can like just really get into unless you have a lot of technical expertise in running your own servers, essentially, and setting sure. up servers and stuff. And I was like, I don't want that. I just want to be able to log in and like go. <laughs> I didn't do anything. That's still a while away. So there was no option. So I'm like, damn, I can't play Final Fantasy 14 1.0 right now. It kind of stinks. While well, I was getting a legacy server, uh, eventually, uh, <laughs> did it happen or no? Okay, I know there's some controversy over it, but a lot of people are like, Square Enix will probably never endorse or support an official legacy 14 server. They want you to forget because they want you to forget. Because yeah, to yeah, them, yeah. it was a shame, as I was put. I was like, I don't know. Maybe if the community is vocal enough in down the line. They can give them the comments like, hey, we want to try it again. Like, it's okay. You did such a great job after the fact. Don't worry about it. Anyway. I was like, dang, what do I do now? What do I play? Oh, yeah, there's Final Fantasy XI. And then everyone loves to say 14 1.0 was just basically a continuation of 11, but worse. <laughs> so 11 should be better because everyone said, oh, even 11 was better than 1.0. I was like, I played 11 when it first came out uh, in North America on PC. I played it on and off, not very seriously. And I remember having okay time with it, but it was confusing as hell. Oh, yeah. Very, very old school MMO where nothing was streamlined. Very. So, but I'd heard 11 had been like tweaked a lot to be more user friendly. I tried to get back into it like two, and a half, two and a half years ago or three years ago, and I gave up almost immediately. Like, it was such a problem to set up again. Hmm. Like, the account and everything. Like, play online. The play oh, yeah. Yeah, play. Yeah, I was yeah, just yeah. like, I got in finally, oh, and then I couldn't God. use a controller, or the controller settings were all wonky. I was like, oh, I gotta do mouse and keyboard, don't I? Or else it's gonna be this gimped controller setup at the time. And everything was still pretty cryptic, despite them saying they had other stuff. So I was just like, I, I walked around a few zones for nostalgia's sake. I was like, all right, bye. So this time, here we go. I'm like, I'm gonna do this right. Google, like, essential add-ons and plugins for Final Fantasy XI. And it directed me to a single program, a window program, and it has everything automated. It's beautiful. So nice. Added, like, there was even one that made some of this stuff look like Final Fantasy XIV. Like, it displayed my HP, MP, and TP mm. just the same way as it does, basically, the Final Fantasy XIII uh, yeah, UI elements. Uh, good, like configure the controller perfectly. Uh, I had a mini map now, like all these extra things. I could see buffs and debuff timers. I was like, oh, basically streamlining it even further on top of what 11 had did. And I'm like, let's do this. Let's go. Got okay. it all set up. Start streaming it. I'm a little lost again. <laughs> I'm like, uh oh, here we go again. I have no idea. There's no quest markers or anything. Yep. This I'm in Sandoria walking around. Oh, I was like, don't. I'm gonna have to go talk to every NPC, right? Then I was, I'm streaming this, and jolly people come in chat and they're like, hey, why are you streaming Final Fantasy XI? Uh, I explained why, what I just did. Like, oh, cool. Well, here, uh, uh, let me give you some guides and stuff. And hey, why don't you go over here and do this? And why don't you do that? They showed me how to get so partying in Final Fantasy XI was like the most notorious thing back in the day, Try, because you cannot you can only level up to a certain level around like 10, 10 11 ish, yeah. and then you really needed to team up with other people yeah. to take down mobs. The further along you got in that pro that process, the harder it got to find a party. And, and on top of that, it wasn't just like it was hard to find people just to play with because you had to communicate with them because the social functions were just literally shouting. And typing. There were no party finders. There were no duty finders. There's nothing like that. There, none of that stuff existed. Pretty much every time I played Eleven, right at that point you're talking about, is where I eventually trailed off for so many reasons. Like, I didn't... The... It was exciting that you needed to rely on people so much, but like the anxiety of not knowing everything or letting somebody down or just the sheer amount of time it took to get to what you wanted to do. <laughs> I just remember every single time, like I was like, oh man, Final Fantasy XI. There are so many things I like about this. And then I just immediately dropped off. And it, it, I think 
to echo that, essentially in the early days, that was not it wasn't just essential to communicate to make parties, but to figure out anything in that oh, game. Yeah. Like that was it. Uh, apparently, someone in the chat was telling me the story that a lot of the objectives in some of the main quests uh, were so cryptic and weird that no one would figure them out. That like eventually, apparently, stories that Japanese GMs started telling some of the Japanese players hints. To help them along, like, oh, you could do this. And they would publish them, and they eventually get into English. And English players like, oh, that's how you do that in the very early days. Mm. But anyway, um, yeah. that so that's one of the aspects is forming a party. And the further you got, you could be waiting for hours. Even if you were, like, very social just to find the right party. Uh, this guy introduced a while ago. There are things called trusts. They're basically AI-controlled uh, party members. Yeah. And you can just like summon up to like initially you can summon up to three to join you and form a full party of four. And you just blaze through stuff. I didn't know that you, this was a thing in Final You Zero. just like wreck everything. Like I got to in that eight hours time, I was like level fifteen. I was like that took like a week or several days back in like that's I'm almost close to getting my sub job already. I was like oh whoa like enemies in the deep parts of like of 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 uh Ronfar Ron the forest yeah yeah the forest Ronfair, area Ronfar, yeah. Well, yeah uh and then the Thine plateau afterwards dude i was yeah. wrecking stuff did you get to the dunes uh, i didn't mean to go that far i was oh, cuz okay. i was actually doing real quests oh uh the only time i went into a really hard area of uh, o uh ordell caves which is like the first real serious like uh city state quest was the only time I had any difficulty with mobs because they were like way too high level for me at one point. I should have been in there at that uh, where I was going. Anyway, that facilitates the progress so much in the game in terms of leveling. I want to, uh, before I forget this, I want to say this one point because it is a yeah. vast difference between 14 and I even say WoW, current WoW uh, versus older MMOs. 11, I can see why people have these very fond memories and kind of a desire to have another 11 type MMO again. It is such a, it focuses so much on nonlinear progression. Hmm. Like there, even though there are story quests, it's not necessarily like you complete them to earn experience. Like you go kill mobs to earn experience in this game. So you have the option to go out and grind and level up. You can do side quests by talking to NPCs, but the, there's no real like continuity. It doesn't like you complete that quest. Oh, now it unlocks another quest. Like so many of the modern MMOs, like 14 and WoW, you complete this quest, another quest marker will appear. That doesn't really happen here. You you have to go to certain NPCs and kind of like interact with them, and one of them might have a quest for you, and it it's gonna end usually. And then there's like there's different kind of like bins of objectives to do and you just kind of go back and forth between them and go at your own pace essentially and i think th that's what some people are yearning for is just that not everything is spoon fed to you yeah. in terms of progression the caveat is that those there's so many damn layers in 11 that are so cryptic and just difficult to understand like every even the helpful people in chat are basically saying you need to have, I have like 10 tabs of the Final Fantasy XI wiki open at any time when I'm playing this game. I'm like, no, that's not, like, that's not good. I was like, I was arguing, with, I said, that isn't great. And back then, you didn't have Wikipedias, you didn't have Reddits, you didn't have Discord. So you had a message board and maybe some like IRC chat or something. I was like, you're not, this stuff was like cryptic as hell. Yeah. And I would argue, you might some people might find that like enjoyable that you, you got to be on, like honest and real in 2018 that's frustrating like you cannot make a mainstream game like that level i mean 11 and they don't yeah 11 has as many players as it does now i mean it's old but they tried doing it with 14 1.0 and that was the result you you got this i mean it had other other large problems that but I think maybe there's a happy medium to be found there. I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Sure. In terms of like not having a main story quest line that you just like that's the progression. You're gonna reach the end game by beating that, beating a story, and then you go into like raid bosses and stuff like that. It was funny because people were like, oh, what's the raid bosses game? And some play like some people chat who are veterans are like, there really aren't raid bosses so much as really tough enemies that you can go and farm. They appear every on um, different like like you know timers and stuff like the notorious monsters 
it, it was just a different beast. And it was such playing through it, it was just so different to go back to that game. The pacing of it, I mean it's very slow oh pace. Oh my god. The combat system. So slow, dude. It, that's what it shares Ugh. most in common with 14, 1.0 and eleven is the pace of battles. Super slow, menu driven, like going through menus. You can the macro stuff as well, but it is very old fashioned and very slow. I mean, having all those NPCs like speeds it up, obviously, but yeah, but there's something about exploring those zones again. Like they're very wide open, like taking it at a slower pace. I kind of appreciated that. I, I, I like basically there are elements from 11 and elements from 14. I'd like to the see merge, merge to together, it. perfect, union. and it would be nice and. Uh, it, yeah, you just don't see anything like that anymore because the time has just moved on. I have a question for you, and the, my my biggest regret always with Eleven is I, I played enough Eleven to get attached to certain things. Like I, I think the music in Eleven is oh, very, yeah, super yeah, good. very super good. Oh yeah, um, and just certain designs of the characters and towns I really liked. Uh, but I always heard, and I was so impressed. And I think the the biggest reason, like why I would keep returning to Eleven, is I love the idea of the, like at the time I initially played it, I love the idea of an MMO, of, of getting together and having a world that was actually alive and, and, and there even if you weren't. Like that was like sci-fi novel exciting to me, but I was always disappointed at how poorly the story was implemented. And uh, even with, with WoW, like I was very frustrated that so much of the story was told through these quest logs and it just wasn't very engaging. I was blown away at like the cutscenes in Final Fantasy XI. That was exactly mm -hmm. what I was looking for. And the agony was amplified when I would hear from people I would see on the internet regularly that are like, oh man, like this this storyline and this expansion is really good. Like there's awesome stuff here with this game. And I felt like I never got to appreciate that story. And I was missing out on potentially a, a great Final Fantasy story that I just didn't experience. With what you were playing... Did the story grab you, and how did it compare to the storytelling of 14? So that is still a gripe I had with it. And I, I was trying to vocalize it with the chat with some of the veterans is that, uh, so to be fair, some of the like quest storyline stuff I, I'd seen multiple times already. So I was like, oh, I remember this. I remember this. But they, had, they had some new cutscenes in there. Uh, I, I forget the character's name. They appear in event. They appear in the Final Fantasy XI crossover event with fourteen, and you get their outfit. Uh, it's this female samurai, I believe. The Taru Taru? No, the, the, the human. Oh, okay. Uh, they're very important though to the storyline. I know that much about it because there's a little bit of a recap in the fourteen one. Uh, it starts off with that at a certain point. Like they're they're in front of just giant crystal, and they walk away, and they have a line of dialogue. They're there were these like I think they might have been new. There were some. They're called like uh like something rhapsodies of uh, Vanadil or something is what they are. They're these these new quest or missions that help develop the story of the world of, of Vanadil. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted more to experience more of that, and it might have been part of my own fault for not following those those quests specifically to keep that story going. And the same thing I was saying, I kind of like the the open progression of it was also kind of like the undoing of why I was frustrated with the, the my level of satisfaction. Uh, I was not feeling a, a good level of satisfaction with the narrative elements of what I played through the eight hours. I, I still felt that I was mostly relying on what I already knew and nostalgia to carry me through. Like, I remember this. I remember what's going on. Yeah, that was cool. But I was like, yeah, but what's the story actually again? Like, what? what why was I doing this? I was like, someone sent me here. <laughs> it was a quest. I was like, yeah, it's and there's a story, but it's mostly still done through text exchange and that text bubble box down at the bottom. And I, I was like, I, I felt like there could be a little bit more of a guiding hand there in towards in terms of pushing you towards the the more story driven quests. Sure. Like I think Eleven could benefit from an actual main scenario. Uh, line which i believe they do have like i'm sure people are screaming at me like that's what the rhapsodies or whatever the the remnants of there's all these new terms and stuff i'm sorry i'm getting it all wrong it was this is so overwhelming but there are specific quest lines you can now go track in to an extent and i think they fulfill the story i just don't think the game pushes you towards them enough hmm. 
I, I had to be told in chat, go here to start this. Go on a wiki to look this up, as I was saying earlier. But I'm, the- I'm like, why is there nothing in the game, like an MP... Like, there were parts of the game where an NPC was... Their dialogue made sense that I need to go over here now, and I'm going to get another part of a quest. Then sometimes I would completely drop the ball, and... I was like, where do I, what do I do now? Like, is there another quest line? Is there more story payoff? It's just inconsistent. I'm with you. And I, I, I get the frustration that you're trying to express. I think the conundrum comes in where you're talking about like the biggest, one of the biggest joys of Final Fantasy XI is this nonlinear progression and how you aren't on this track the whole time. Uh, but you also want a little bit more of a guiding hand. And so how do you kind of fuse those two yeah. ideas? Well, it comes from like, it comes from 14 though. Cause you asked, sure. that was the other thing you asked me about yeah. Is that 14 definitely has a very focused, a very specific purpose and a goal to achieve with its main story you quest. Very funneled, yeah. They are literally called main scenario quests, mm-hmm. and they are required to progress. You have to complete them in order to progress to certain parts and even areas of the game. Those are the initial gate walls until you get to end game stuff. Mm-hmm. Whereas in 11, it's just your level. You literally can go to almost, I think, most anywhere. Uh, in the original world, mm-hmm. and just depending if you survive the mobs. Whereas in 14, that's not entirely true. It's like some areas are gated off until you've done enough of the story quest. Like entire zones will be locked out from you until you've done certain stuff. So, do you want you to be able to go anywhere but just stronger pointers in certain directions? I, I, I would like there, I, basically, in the context of 11, I wish there was in game signals whether it's quest flags or whatever that says if you would like to focus on a main scenario there is one in this game follow these quest lines Hmm. however if you want to get the most out of this game experience the world like see more and not just like rush through the like to the end we encourage you to go out and do these other things but there's less guidance with those you're gonna have to like figure things out on your own you have to interact with people but should you ever get like frustrated with that I, I, I feel like that's what they should have done. Is like, there's a point where everyone's going to break probably on that, and they're going to want to come back to something familiar, something where they're going to get a, a sense of immediate reward, sense mm-hmm. of like, like fixed, like a, uh, a, a, a certain certainty in terms of progress. And now it should have been the main scenario. I think that, yes, they could have had a little bit more of a guiding hand saying, if you like just reminders, they're just reminders sure. saying, Hey, you could go back to this now if you want to, if you're not having a good time with this. So, after this, this intense chat helpful eight hours of Final Fantasy 11 and what you experienced, do you feel satisfied with this revisit? Do you want to play more? Like, where, what's your current feeling? So, like, Final I Fantasy got 11? so it ended on a, a bit of a sour note <laughs> that stinks. Okay. Um, so I was doing uh, the training drill qu- uh, mission. Uh, it's the one you got to do to rank to get the next rank in Sandoria. I, I originally completed it with a group of 20 people back when the game was new. And I was pretty close to like the end of where I was playing. I did that. I went to two other zones after that, and I quit playing after that originally. So I tried to do it with uh, my AI party members, and it was a nice quest line. Like the 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 soldiers and the were guy. They're telling me, "Hey, there's a problem going on. Go down here. All right, go down there and investigate." Oh, one of our members fell down. We got to like in the caves. We got to find them. I get into the caves, and it falls apart there. Just no more direction. The NPC I go talk to is like, I don't have time to chat with you. Get out of here. And I'm like, okay. So uh, I go down a different. I go down these different directions, and they're okay. They're moderately tough enemies. I'm like, okay. I'm just gonna keep killing them. Eventually, I'll come across something that might be the objective. Yeah. And that's when I ended up in areas with two high level enemy enemies that wrecked me. And I kept asking chat, I'm like, hey, what am I supposed to do? Like, why did it drop the ball here? Like just a line of text giving me a hint would have been enough. And they're like, go read the wiki. And I kind of <laughs> I kind of snapped at that point because I had just lectured chat about like, that's nice that all that information is gathered now. But I was like, I really, am, like, is there a way to do this without looking at the wiki? Like, there, people had to figure out. That's what they dropped the, oh, the GMs used to have to tell you because it was that cryptic. I'm like, but it's 2018. Haven't they fixed this game and like kind of like streamlined it a bit? This seems like an oversight. This is so early in the game. Why is this one so difficult? Like to figure out what to do. Still, like I was like, do you not see my problem? Like the problem here that yeah, what's up? 
And they were just like content to let me kind of meander. Like, if you're not going to read the wiki, then have fun making it harder on yourself. And I'm like, okay. And I died twice. And I had to like warp back. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to call it here. Like, I'm getting pretty tired in general. I was also getting like tired. So I'm like, maybe I should stop. Like, this is eight hours. Come on. Like, right. maybe I need to take a break and come back. But to answer you, my objective is I want to get past that. I'm definitely going to – I'll either just look up what to do and just, like, you know, compromise on that. So what's the end goal? I want to get to zones I never saw before. Okay. I, like I want to see the game. I, I'd like to see the end of the story. That might be too long of a time investment sure. for how busy I am. But my – primary goal is to get to zones i never saw before in person like in game not through trailers and videos i just want to see that because yeah. i love what uh, what i have seen in the world when i originally played and now being remi- like seeing it again i still love it it's like yeah i want to see the rest of the world of a van deal here this kind of stinks like sure. that i've never saw all of it cool. so yeah brad did any of that make you want to revisit fomacy uh I'm like in the boat with Damiani where I just want to see stuff I hadn't seen before. Sure. I think I would be good after eight hours. Yeah. Because like when you're talking about it, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember a lot of those good times. And I'm like, oh yeah, a lot of that sucks now. Yep. Like it would not be as, like it was cool when I played it because it was my first MMO ever. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just kind of going through the game and figuring it's like when you're talking about a story, I was thinking in my head, I'm like, (laughs) I don't remember there being a story. Like I don't remember uh, any of this. It's interesting. I don't know what like a better term for it, but like genre forgiveness. Yeah. Where I, I remember my early days in EverQuest, and I remember my early days with like Final Fantasy XI and and WoW as well, where like something would really frustrate me, and I'd be like, "Well, it is still kind of crazy that I'm playing with hundreds of or thousands of people at the same time," and I'm like, "It's probably just a <laughs> yeah. shitty thing that yeah I needs was, to happen to make." I this was work. totally in that honeymoon phase I was playing too. Yes, like, I was exactly. just like blown away. I was playing a game with people online yeah. somewhere. Yeah, and I think. I catch myself sometimes when I'm playing VR as well, where I'm like, this is weird, but whoa, I'm in VR. Yeah, you know, you, you really do. Cool. You have that, that honeymoon phase, indeed. Uh, Brad, talk to me about a game that you were intimately familiar with. Oh, that yeah. just got maybe. a huge Shout out Colossus, yeah. maybe. The remake, Damiani. Very f- fluent with this game, also, dude. Yeah, what I like is, Brad, you. Uh, Aired some grievances with the Secret of Mana remake, but you are lighting up. You're smiling I when think, we're talking about Shadow I Colossus. I think because to here? me, Shadow Colossus is just a better game for what I look for in a video game. Mm-hmm. What is that? What are you looking for? I wasn't as frustrated at moments in this game. Like, with just like, like I said, with Secret of Mana, I just got a lot of little nitpicks here and there, but it was just a lot of them building up. Mm-hmm. Shadow Colossus, I have like just a few complaints with. Like, the camera sometimes a little wonky. When I was playing it, when I first started playing it again, I was like, oh, man, I was, I was holding on to that guy. That's BS kind of thing mm-hmm. like that. But as I played it more and more and more, I started to get into this like kind of groove where everything was clicking perfectly. Everything was working how I wanted it to. Sure. And I was uh, like, I think this game just has a kind of a steep learning curve. Yeah, and that is a complaint that you hear lobbied at Shadow of the Colossus a yeah. lot is oh, that yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't feel very good. Right. Um, and that's, that is not something that the remake, in my experience with it, like... Mm-hmm. It doesn't. It still feels like it's Shadow super, of the Colossus. Yeah, it I think still that's feels like a lot to the game. And you think that's okay? I think it's okay because I think it, it's one of my favorite games of all time. Though that's mm-hmm. why, like the original Shadow Colossus, is one of my top games ever. And this is just like, here's this game I love, but just looks really great. I'm like, yes, this is good. I, I, I wish they did maybe a little more. Like I can't help but wondering, like maybe like a a couple extra Colossi or something, something a little different to differentiate it. But I know because I. This might be selfish to me when I think of RE Remake. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that's like the best remake of all time to sure. me. Yep. Because it took this We've thing. We've said that before. Yeah, and it's like, because uh, Mikami got a second crack at it, you know, kind of thing like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you had really worked on this game at all. They just kind of took this game that yeah, was he, there. Yeah, I think that's the case with that one. Is yeah. That they couldn't go cross they, yeah, they can't, like, too far into adding new content. Exactly. Hmm. They added one, well, as far as we know, one big secret, the, yeah. the extra Dorman blade hidden underneath the main shrine of worship, mm-hmm. which is cool. Like the the yeah. well, some people actually don't like that. I'm actually curious. I don't know if you've even tried um, to do it yet. Oh, you need the coins, the 79 right? collectible coins that are brand new, yeah. new collectibles added to this game, or in the original. There's some people who are like, why are they adding new collectibles to this game? And, uh, like some people just took offense to the concept of adding even just that. Yeah, that doesn't bug me at all. It seems pretty inoffensive to me because it's so easy to ignore. Yeah, yeah. Ben, I didn't even see a coin until like the sec my second run through of this right. game. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but with with the remake specifically, let's let's go back and talk about Shadow of the Colossus originally. You said this is one of your favorite games of mm-hmm. all time. Why does it hold such a high place in your heart? Because uh, like it does it doesn't it does its own thing. I would say like that. I love the idea that there's no other enemies in this game except the Colossus. This mm-hmm. game essentially just bosses the entire game, and I love it. It's just like a big, open, barren world that I really love just exploring. I it, I totally get why people like don't like this, though, about the kind of game. Like, yeah, they may not like that world. There's maybe not something for you to do in it. I just really love the journey of going through the whole world and getting to each of these Colossus, which feel like... When I first played the game on PS2, it was like, I'd never seen anything like that before. Mm-hmm. When you see, like, these huge things, it was crazy. Like, there was nothing like that kind right. of thing now, but we're in 2018 now, but I'm still getting this feeling of, like, this is really awesome and insane, the scope that's going on in this game. Right. Uh, you talked about the focus, how you really loved that the Colossi are the only things that you encounter. Mm-hmm. And when you compare enemy encounters to Shadow of the Colossus, almost anything else, not everything, but almost mm-hmm. anything else, like, when I think about enemies in other games, it's like... They die. They either die so quickly or just have, like, one thing that they do. It's like, here's the heavily armored enemy that you have to do an extra trick to get rid of. Here's the enemy that shoots a thing that blows up into different colors. Like, they're, they're, they're very uh-huh. narrowly defined by, like, utility. What I like about Shadow of the Colossus is when you encounter something, it's like... Here is how it like moves across this place. Here's when you're on this specific part of its body, how it will react to mm-hmm. you. Like they're just so multifaceted and interesting. And the reason they are is because the game doesn't include anything else. Like they can just focus, focus and that, add yeah. a lot to that specific creature that you're fighting and feels like a big deal at the time. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, like I, I like that. Mm-hmm. I know some people get upset about the sparseness of the world of, of Shadow of the Colossus. Yeah. That there's nothing to do except fight the Colossi. And, um, and you know what? But That's it's supposed what, to be a sparse world. But uh, yeah, there's, it's, there's, it's yeah, a, there's a lore reason you, why it's yeah, like that. It's, yeah. it's a lore reason. It's an artistic thing as well, you could argue. Mm. But I would say to those people, some of the things that do what they do best are because they focus on w- small, small amount of things. Or mm-hmm. they focus on one specialty. Um, analogy, like, sorry, we're going to food here. Mm-hmm. Some of the best food places don't have, like, I'm these ridiculous things. menus with, like, hundreds of items. They'll usually have, like, just one type of thing and a few variations of it, like chicken. Here's three chickens. Burgers. Here's, like, three different types of burgers. Or it's a taco place. It's just tacos. They don't go crazy and start throwing all these other stuff in. To me, that's Shadow of the Colossus. It's so good because they knew, they set out to do one specific thing, and that's they didn't. They weren't deterred by anything else. And everything you just said, Ben, about like the the design of the Colossus, like that's it. Like right. they had to come up with these creative, ridiculous ways to make them feel the sense of awe and wonder each time you met a new one. Not just in their appearance, but their environment, how they move across it, how they react. Like their the, just their mannerisms and stuff. They're all different enough mm-hmm. and. That had to take a lot of, like, planning and design and, like, brainstorming meetings and, like, going back and forth. I mean, we all uh, most people should know the story that there are way more that they plan yeah. to put in there. And just, like, the fact that they cut so many and that's all they were working on shows the level of complexity at the time when yeah. it first came out with that enemy AI, like, going to that yeah, degree. Like, I it, was it was unseen, unheard of. I th- it was even more complex in its development. I think it was supposed to be co-op originally, like, three people. Taking mm-hmm. on class and they just kind of like on PS2 like that. Was, there was a that's like there was a prototype video yeah. of that. So like if that's what was an idea, that's like super ambitious yeah. for the time to try to even think of something like that. Co-op Brad, Shadow. Uh, we, we've talked about Damiani. I really like it. the the sense of awe and wonder that these colossi bring. We talked about the sparseness of the world. How does the remake, if the remake does, how does the remake enhance that for you? What makes this well, remake do an effective job of capturing like, that spirit? When I look back at Shadow Colossus, especially on PS2 thing, doesn't look very good. Like, it looks pretty... I, I was surprised. I was like, whoa. It looked better in my mind from what I remember. Mm. Like, when I'm just seeing, like, the world and everything like that. It just looks so much more rich. Like, me and Dami always talk about this part. The, the Zelda force we always want in a Zelda game. There's just some really sick, thick force that we just want in a Zelda game so bad mm. that they couldn't uh, get across on the PS2 just because of the limitations. Do you, do you feel like... Yeah. Because sometimes yeah. you hear people say when they come out with a remake, oh, this is like how I remember it in my mind. Uh, is there that sense with Shadow of the Colossus or does it go further beyond? It's just that? like, it, it's further beyond for me. Just mm-hmm. like, I'm like, whoa, this looks so much bigger than I remember. It helps because I'm playing in 4K. So I'm like, dude, this mm-hmm. looks awesome as I'm going through this game. 
it's definitely a reimagined world. Yeah. It, it basically, it adds a lot, in my opinion, it adds a lot more personality to each of the different regions. Yeah, they feel more distinct now. And I, I know some people take, a, a, not offense, but some, some people don't agree with the, the stylistic change that they do by bringing the more real, the, the, the greater sense of realism because of Blue Point's efforts to the, the, the make the world more like f- like lush with life, you mm-hmm. know, all the flora and fauna and stuff going around, like the dense forest we were just talking about. They like the more minimalistic approach sure. of the, the original game. I think both are, you have both, and they're both great for yeah. what they do. Yeah, you yeah. have the original version, and you can always go back to that and see that world. This is what I want. This is everything I wanted out of a remake because it went above and beyond in terms of like taking that world and just amping it up to like a hundred. It was like, holy crap. Like going over that bridge to go to the second Colossus was like, eh, there's some water down there. It's a lake. Now it's like these like waterfalls and rapids. I was like, what the hell? I was like, Dang, they went all out. And then, yeah, this is the first time through the force, the light rays coming. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, this is this is phenomenal. I was like, we were joking the whole time. Like, it's like Uncharted. Like, Uncharted, baby. Yeah, Uncharted yeah, right there. Yeah, it's like balls yeah. in your court, Uncharted. Where's, yeah. what, what are you going to do about this? It looked really good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've been doing a lot of playthroughs, and I did all the time attacks. Mm-hmm. And I was just having so much fun playing through these guys over and over again. Getting the time attacks, unlocking the cool weapons you get. You get the the sword from uh, Eco, the Queen's Blade, that can like one shot Colossae. Mm-hmm. Just having a blast doing all that stuff. Man, love that game. Having a good time. Yeah, I'm having a good time, man. Nice. Uh, there's a game that I want to talk about, and I feel like I'm going through Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door treatment with it, where not You're just only like, whoa, yeah, exactly, nice. where it's like not only there's like oh I really liked this and bummer it's a shame that I missed it, where it's like oh I missed this. And it's amazing. But like, it's like it's really you're still good. experiencing it. You're still I am. getting to yeah. it. I'm still experiencing I just feel like a, a certain level of like, oh, why didn't I get to this sooner? Uh, I am playing through and I'm at the very end. Like the very end will probably finish tonight as I'm waiting for this thing to export and upload. Uh, Ori in the Blind Forest. Ooh. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm, at, I'm at the very end of it. And it is... It is a game that is way more than the sum of its parts, where I think you can break it down and you can be like, hey, here is this absolutely gorgeous, lush with color, immaculately detailed world. Like, just watching it in motion, the amount of detail that they put in any given environment, uh, the way that the colors blend together, the way that uh, you'll be in one area and it's just like a wash in like this nice soft blue glow. And then you go to another area and it's like this harsh orange. Like, And they'll do things with the background and the foreground where you'll have kind of enemies scurrying about and it just really creates a good sense of liveliness to it. Uh, but you really have to sit down and, and play it and see it happen in motion mm-hmm. to really get the full sense of it. Um, it is, you know, kind of a, a Metroidvania. You are uncovering parts of a map. You can uh, yeah. get more health modules and you're getting experience. You can level up and put it into skills. But it's how all of those elements blend together that makes for a really remarkable experience. And the way that it's just like perfectly kind of spread out. Uh, because it is a game that is really hard. Uh, I think harder than I was expecting, harder than I remember the conversation being about it, uh, because you, so many things will kill you, like, instantly, especially early on, or uh, you'll be, it will ask you to do a lot. Uh, like, you'll, you'll get this, like, glider, basically. Think of, uh, like, the leaf from Wind Waker or the mm-hmm. glider in Breath of the Wild, where you'll have to navigate through gusts of wind across, like, a room of spikes. Um, and you just have to very, very carefully, like, I'm, I was, last night I was at a segment where I just had to, like, slightly tap the D-pad very rapidly, and you're, like, <laughs> tensing up. Ben, this reminds uh, me yeah. of the levels in Donkey Kong Country 2 where you're the parrot, and you're flying through, sure. like, the, yep. uh, the thorns. Very good comparison, absolutely. Coughing up, going, bah, bah, shooting out, like, eggs or whatever you're shooting out. Um... And there are definitely times, you die a lot, uh, but I think the reason that it works, and I like the concession of it so much, is they sort of give you um, this pool of resources that you can upgrade uh, by finding things without in the world, where you can spend a point of it to save pretty Mm -hmm. much anywhere. And 
that's what makes it work is if you don't save, like there have been definitely times where I've forgotten to save like, and it's like, oh wait, no, I have to do that whole part again. That's on me. I have to think about saving as a resource. I have to spend it like I would like a health potion mm-hmm. or like a buff up item. Like I really have to incorporate, hey, do I want to spend this save here? Am I going to run out of juice for, for my save and my other abilities? Or do I not want to use it? And so not only does it kind of put the onus on you, where it's like, hey, this is going to be hard. You figure out where to put the checkpoints. But it also makes you think of it as a resource, which I think is really cool and has been a very fun uh, mechanic for me. And I just feel like the rate at which you get stuff, because I think in games like this, especially when they're so challenging, and especially when they're having you go through so many... Um, obstacles, it's important to constantly change things up and give you new tools to play with. And the tools that they give you are so much fun. Uh, The best one, I think, is you get the ability to, with enemies and projectiles, use them to launch yourself into the air, where basically you you freeze time and you can, like, figure out, okay, I'm going to take this thing, I'm going to grab onto it, and I'm going to use it to launch. Hmm. And so there will be platforming sections where, like, things will be falling from the sky, and you have to jump, and you have to, like, grab on and launch from all of these things. Cool. And that just feels really good, but that's not the only way that you can use it. You can also fire projectiles back at enemies, hmm. where you have your own projectile that you can use, but there are certain enemies where it's like, okay, that's not very effective, that's going to take forever. It would be far more effective if I am a total baller, I grab their projectile out of the air, and I fling it back to Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it has just been a game that we. J- I was just playing with my girlfriend on a whim. I don't know why we started playing it. I think she thought it looked cool, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I've been meaning to play that," and have just completely fallen in love with it. Uh, the, the 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 bad thing, and I actually do think it's legitimately bad that I want to say about it is it is a game that is clearly focusing so much on presentation. I talked about how gorgeous and how detailed it was. But there are times, like, everything, like, there are explosions of color from both you and the enemy, or there will be things falling from the sky, and there are just, there have been so many instances where I'll, I'll, I'll die or I'll get hit by something, I'm like, I didn't e- I couldn't even see that. The old like, cuphead syndrome. Sure, like, there's just so much noise on the screen. I actually think it, it communicates that information less effectively than cuphead, oh. where, like, uh. Things will get completely lost, and I will truly, like, on many occasions, I'll have no idea where that came from. And so I, I don't know how they could fix that. Uh, I, I, they just need to make it a little bit more distinct uh, than they sure. currently do. Um, and that's that's been a little bit frustrating. But, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited because we're getting into it, and we're loving it, and we're almost done with it. And it's like, hey, that sequel is Sequel's coming, coming yep. baby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Damiani, uh, well, both of you, really. It seems like a game that both of you would love, your kind of style. Have you guys played Ori at all? So I feel bad because I actually played it at the E3 before it came out at mm-hmm. Microsoft's uh, booth. And I, I, like, I was really like sold on it. I was like, this is pretty good. I yeah. want to play this. And I just forgot about it. And every time it would come up, I was like, oh, yeah, Ori, I, did, I need to play this game. Holy crap. Yeah. And I just keep forgetting about it. And I'm like, crap. And even with the sequel coming out, I was like, wow, I didn't play the first one. There's already a second one coming out. I feel I feel ashamed. Like, this kind of stinks. Mm-hmm. Like, it's definitely a game I, I like, eventually I'm going to remember to, like, oh, I, I want to play this. I have time to play this. It's happening. Yeah. Uh, I just need that moment to, like, line up. And I, I do want to play through it. But, yeah, just from, like, that 15-minute portion, I, it was basically the beginning of the game. They, they said 15 minutes, go. Like, do what you want. Like, yeah. in the first 15 minutes, it was a complete game. I was like, okay, awesome. And I, I, I was like, yeah, this is pretty good. I was a little I, – I love the visual style from everything I'd seen beforehand. I was a little skeptical about how when everyone throws around the term Metrovania, I'm like, all right, you're setting up some expectations here. Mm-hmm. But let's see. I was like, all right, I – I, I dig what you're doing here. Uh, yeah. I'd like to see more of this. And that's kind of where it ended. Yeah. Well, may, but maybe it won't end there. We'll see. I would like to make a strong push for it. I remember making a strong push for Shovel Knight. And I mm-hmm. feel like this kind of falls into this, a similar category. Yeah, I don't think well, you need to nudge me as much for this one. Sure. This is just the, the timing thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, it fell into a weird space for me. And I think this kind of happens. At least it happens for me where it's kind of a consequence of the job. And I don't know if this happens to you guys. Uh, but I remember when Ori came out, I think Bloodworth reviewed it and like Elise really loved it and talked about it and streamed it. And so it was like, hey, this looks cool. I'm going to put like a feather in it. But like at Game Shows, we got this covered and I just kind of moved on uh, to focus on things that weren't being covered. And I, I 
I hate that because I wish I would have played it uh, at the time. But are there things where you've skipped over them, Brad, where you're like, oh, somebody else has this, Blood has this, Brand has yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, Brand just the nature this. of our job kind of thing. Like, yeah, I want, I want to play that. Like, yeah, I'm playing through uh, Yakuza, but I'm like... Eh. Do I really need to? It feels like selfish almost for me playing because I just want to play it for myself. Like I'm not going to talk about Kiwami yeah. really probably or anything like that, but I'm just like, oh, I'm always thinking about playing something. I'm like, what could I do with this for work kind of thing like sure. that. Sure. But sometimes I'm like, no, I'm just playing this for me, man. Yeah. Once, once in a while you do have to, uh, not even once in a while, often I think you do have to take those games and just yeah. have them for yourself. Yeah. Have you played any Ori, Brad? Nope. One, same thing, Damiani. One of those games I always want to play, just never got to it. Yeah. It's it's nice that I feel so positively about this because there, there are many games that I get on with Frame Trap and I'm like, oh, I love this. Also, it's 50 hours long and that's not the case. <laughs> yes. yeah. Where it's like, hey, I can recommend this to you. It's a reasonable length and I'm almost positive you'll yeah, like it. Yeah, you're telling me to play like Trails of Cold Steel. I'm like, yeah, yeah but... Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, and it's not something that takes a while to understand. You'll yeah. understand it immediately, yeah, yeah. which is nice. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. Um, the last game that we're going to talk about today, not uh, more of an update, really. Tell me about Luigi's Balloon World. Oh, yeah. in, oh my God, uh, yeah. Please Mario tell me about this. Yeah, free update for Super Mario Odyssey. Basically, in almost every kingdom uh, near the start, you can find Luigi. And he will offer you one of two options. Uh, it's an online mode. Um, Luigi's Balloon World, you have two options. You can either do find it or hide it. Very simple. In find it, you pick from a, a list of different char- uh, other players' balloons that they've hidden somewhere within the world. And you're going to see a few different numbers on there, and it's just kind of important to pay attention to. Uh, you can see the timer, which is how long you will have to find that balloon, and then there will be a coin value. You have to buy into these challenges. So if you if you pay this fee... You'll be able to try this. Uh, to if you want to retry it, should you fail, the the reentry fee is a little uh, less steep. So it cuts it back. What is the general range of fees for this stuff? How okay, so it, it can be as cheap as uh, ten to twenty coins. When you, so you have a ranking as you rank up, values change. So early on, it's pretty cheap. Like it's it's very low cost, and the payoffs are pretty good. So. Before I get into any more details, if you're looking for a way to get a lot of coins very easily to buy all those costumes, oh. this serves beautifully as knocking it out. I can finally get and, that and, and with, with both of them, with the find it and hide it, you're earning coins through both of these. So, yeah, again, and find it, uh, you can kind of see the challenge. Like, the further down you get, the higher the rank, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. And you can get a glimpse of the directions. What you'll do is when you, you select one option, before you even begin, you're in a little round area. Uh, and if you go beyond the, the barrier of it, it begins the timer. So you can actually select one, buy into it, wait there without any time, and you can like look around. You can try and see if you can see the balloon at the beginning. There's an arrow above your head that tells you the general direction. It actually points up or down and kind of give you like height mm. uh, mm-hmm. if it's above or below you. And then there's a meter number by you that tells you as you're getting closer, it'll count down. So when the, the arrow will eventually vanish when you get within a range, and you gotta rely on your visual acuity, and then the, 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 the distance marker to, or distance measurement to see how close you are. And you just got to pop the balloon. If you pop the balloon you f- in the time, you get the reward uh, that you were promised. If you keep finding more and more in a row without failing, you get like a chain bonus basically for that as well. Um, so here's the thing. I really enjoyed that. It, it is really fun to try and find people's balloons. It really tests how well you know levels. Um, a lot of them you're going to fail the first time, but it's no big deal. You get closer and closer. You start scouting around. You can even use camera mode to cheat. Camera mode will freeze, stop the clock, and let you like look around and everything. Uh, even when you fail, you get a chance to look around until you exit back out. It's fun to do. The only small gripe I have is that there are two kingdoms that have uh, that uh, glitchers, exploiters, are putting the balloons in ridiculous places. Uh, in uh, the uh, Mushroom Kingdom, people found a way to put it underneath the castle <laughs> and with the scooter glitch. So if you don't know how to do that, you're never getting the balloon. And you'll understand why they're doing this in a second. And then in another, in the Metro Kingdom, a lot of people are hiding them under buildings, basically, with the scooter. The reason they're it's doing this... It's always a race to the bottom, isn't it? It's I hate it. A, I wish there was, so I wish there was a way to report those and say, kick those out. Like, get rid of those, please. Like, because you buy in... They're usually expensive. And you buy into them, and you fail, you're like, oh, crap. And then you waste all that time trying to figure out. 
thankfully chat was like, dude, that's a glitch one. Don't do it. It's why I almost never take leaderboard seriously because I feel like so many times the people at the top for online leaderboards are just like the people that found a way to break the game. Yes. The, 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 that's, yes, I totally agree with you. Um, I also feel before I, uh, the, the complaint is, uh, cause it, they're doing this because of hide it and hide it. You get up to 30, uh, a certain amount of time, uh, to run around a, a level and press the, the button to set your balloon down, or it'll try and set it at the closest safe, like solid piece of ground when the timer runs out hmm. and you get more coins based on how hard it is to find basically like the longer it goes unpopped the more coins you'll get so that's why people are putting them in the glitch places because it's the they get a big payout when people keep failing it but the other let's say there were no glitches i feel like there is a trend it's gonna happen i feel like everyone's going on youtube and watching the best spot to hide your balloon guide because there was one in uh in sand kingdom or uh, the 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 one with the the frozen desert one at first, the uh, inverted inverted pyramid. Mm-hmm. Everyone was jumping off the top and then hugging the wall with the hat like toss trick. There's this little tiny ledge you can kind of just like jam yourself into, and everyone was putting theirs there. Like every other one was like that arrow was going up to the pyramid. I was like, it, it's in that stupid ledge, isn't it? And I'm like, yep. Every, like ten of these have been like on the ledge. I was like, this makes me not even want to check it out. But. They're not, but the, here's the thing. For every one of those, all you have to do is start looking at the arrow. I love that arrow at the beginning because you just hover over the, the balloon option. You see the arrow before you even select it. So if you see the arrow pointing in the same direction, like, okay, I've done that one. I see. You keep going till you see the arrow. I just kept going until I saw an arrow in a different direction. Like, all right, let's try this one. It's a direction I haven't gone. It's so quick and easy. Like, it's, it's just... It's not frustrating to have to deal with the like uh, an, a time when you get a repetitive one. You just quit it, go back, and like you lost some coins, but you're earning so many that who cares? Like it's only the glitch ones that are like really frustrating. But as you play more of it, you, you're gonna see like that. That's a glitch one, and there are only so many of them. With hide it, can you see like how long somebody has gone and the payout they've gotten for for like a really long unfound balloon? Uh, you can, the value, the payoff of the balloon goes up as it hasn't been found. Like okay. that's how they judge so the difficulty. But you can, and you can see that value. Yeah. So when you, so it's just like a little like menu. It's a little like column and you'll see the person's like, like icon avatar and their name. You'll see their star ranking, uh, as you collect more balloons and as you do better hiding it, you rank up. Which, as I said, scales all the values for your coin rewards. You'll just see that the entry fee you have to pay Luigi to try to attempt to find it once. You'll see the payoff if you find that balloon. You are getting this many coins. Okay. So you will see the, 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 the definitive rewards for every single one. Roughly, how many coins have you, Michael Damiani? So I with? think I was like at seven thousand, and I hit that nine 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 cap. Uh, when that short play session, I'd play for maybe an hour. Oh. And I bought the skeleton outfit. I was like, all right, if you want to go, like, if you played it for a few hours, or just one hour every night for probably like a few days, you'd probably have enough coins to buy everything in that game. It's so nice that this is free. Yeah, it's a free update. And I was kind of secretly, I, I tried to encourage people to nominate it for one of our group streams because there, there are so many, like, there are ways we could have done, like, who it's could a find idea. a certain balloon fest? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's fun. Uh, it, it, there's some net minor networking issues because you do have to be online early on. When I was trying, I would try to load the balloon challenge. Like you talk to Luigi, you say yes. It then reloads the level, and when you finish, it sends you back and then tries to reload the level again. It would hang on that black loading screen for a long time. Mm. And I was like, it's. Just the level I was in. Why is it taking so long to load back? And sure. people are like, and eh, then Nintendo's been having congestion issues. So I was like, man, if they go to paid service eventually, and this is like more frequent, they they gotta not have this. But sure. other, that was very brief that that actually happened. Didn't happen again after a small period. You finished Odyssey, didn't you, Brad? Yep, sure did. Uh, do you have any? desire to 100% it because I still I still have that uh, s- spark to somewhere to 100% within me. it no like okay. I have more desire to go back and play Breath of the Wild on hero mode like that seems more appealing to me like this whole balloon thing not for me like what do you it, think that is I don't know like I just 
the tracking down a balloon. I don't really feel like doing that. Like, if I'm going to play Odyssey, I'd want to get all the moons. I'd rather do that instead. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just like, balloon, it's fine. It's just not for me. Doesn't speak to Bradley Ellis. No. Nah. I did encounter something that I, do, I, I hope speaks to you. Okay. I've been meaning to tell you about it for a while. Uh, and that is Hojake! Oh. Okay. Try to make that a stealthy one. Kind of let down. I thought it was going to be something like... Nah. Really sexy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, poor Brad. He's like, like man. Brad, like, okay. Oh, oh, talking. Talking. Yeah. I'll have to like get <laughs> you a makeup gift. <laughs> Thanks, for, for building you up for that, uh, that trick there. Oh, but you got five fantasy seven leaks, Ben? What? They would never trust me with five fantasy seven yeah. leaks. Would they trust Damiani? No. Yeah. That's nothing against anyone. you, Damiani. Nobody enough. gets yeah. those leaks. They don't trust no more, dude. Yeah, uh, I don't trust them more. That's right. <laughs> For the Hotaki this week, and something that I'm continuing to be fascinated by, we've, we've already talked about Twitch a lot. Yes. Uh, but one thing that we haven't really touched on is how more explicitly integrated Twitch is becoming. I was playing Fortnite last night, uh, and they're like, hey, log into your Twitch Prime to get this this loot. Mm, uh, you, yep. they've, they've done similar promotions with like Overwatch and Hearthstone mm-hmm. and plenty of other games as well. And they're getting very explicitly tied into Twitch. Twitch is becoming a dominant platform. Uh, We've talked about how games that maybe wouldn't have been successful or as successful because of the Twitch ecosystem have kind of bubbled up to the top. And so this has to be something that game developers are thinking about. When you're making a game, I think, at least depending on the type of game that you're making, you you want to think to yourself, how is this going to look for people who are live streaming it. What's that process going to be like? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you on a general level, are you worried about games being designed around Twitch? How much of a concern do you think that that actually is? I think... Or is it a good thing? I don't know. I think it's it could be good and both. It like depends on the type of game they're trying to make. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're making... If, like, uh, it depends who's making it, too. Like, if someone like Uweda said to me, or, like, is making a game where he has Twitch in mind, I'd be like, hmm, that could be interesting. I don't know what he's going to do. Right. But at the same time, I'm, like, thinking about, like, they're making a game just to get this certain audience. I'm thinking, like, oh, Resident Evil. They just want, like, the jump scared kind of thing like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it'll work as well. Yeah, I don't know. Do, do like, little promotional things bother you at all? Mm, not really. Okay. Like, not... Stuff like that in games, period, doesn't really bother me anymore. Like, I know it bugs, like, Kyle, like, Link being in uh, Mario Kart and stuff like that. But, like, sure. I'm just like, God, I don't know. It doesn't really bug me anymore. I, the ones that, it's not a big deal. I'm not super upset about it. But there are sometimes you'll get these cosmetic items where it's just this really ugly, like, purple yeah, if it's skin like, suit. Really, and it's yeah, like, why, why if does it's this just, exist? If it's, like, really stupid and dumb and feels yeah. low effort, then, yeah, that always sucks. But if they put in, like, the time and effort to make something really cool, yeah, it's awesome. Damian, do you think this is something that developers are, are wrestling with? Do you think that this is happening? What scale do you think it's happening at? I mean, I, I, I think it's kind of the direction everything's going, honestly. Mm-hmm. Just because uh, slightly, I mean, it's Twitch related, but there seems to be a new metric to judge how an online or multiplayer online multiplayer game is going to do based on, not on its reviews now, not its Metacritic, but Twitch on numbers? its Twitch placement on during its release week, on mm-hmm. release day. Is it in the number one spot? How long was it in the number one spot? Oh, that means it's going to be successful this long. And there's been some pushback I've seen. Some people are like, it's getting less, di- not as challenging to get a game in the number one spot on a launch <laughs> day anymore mm-hmm. if you have certain things going for it. Because there are a lot of people who do, for various reasons want to jump on to a new online game, especially Battle Royale type games, yeah, right to now. get in there and try it out because it could be the next big thing. I think it's a little... Ex- uh, it's smart, but it's also exploitative a little bit. But it's basically relying on the streamers. Like, hey, streamers also are profiting out of this, like especially part- Twitch partners. If this is the next big game... They're going to want to stream it because everyone's going to watch it. They're going to get higher viewership. They're going to get more subscribers. It's part of the ecosystem. I'm going to call it an ecosystem now. Developers, I think, are keeping in mind because I think they see it as kind of a symbiotic relationship with uh, Twitch streamers in that, hey, you're helping us out by streaming it and stuff, and we're we're going to make it stream friendly because we're going to put in these features. We're going to make the UI customizable to, to cater to like the most common popular layout styles or Twitch like we'll even throw in like 
a system to help with your Twitch alerts built in the game. The, the, the redeemable, like items that you get through overwatch and, and Fortnite now it's like hey just even watching it you just tell your 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 mm-hmm. viewers that if they just watch it they can get in-game items isn't that awesome like we're helping you out so much in return you're you stream it and you're helping us out by giving us the game exposure but you're also making money off of it it's like it's like it, it's a two, definitely a two-way street and i think both i mean it's developers are just hip to it now I, I but i'm worried that's gonna become too much of a crutch is that it's developers going to think that's they rely too much on that, put too much emphasis on trying to cater to the Twitch crowd, Twitch streamers, and I think it might make it might make things a little bit too homogenous. I think everything's going to become too like everything's going to become the same thing. Everything's going to become predictable in certain in certain types of genres of game. Like I'll just say like with battle royale, that's probably going to there's going to be a point probably this year where like. Oh gosh, it's a meme. Another battle royale reached number one on Twitch. And so you think it's just inevitably going to get oversaturated? Yeah, it's just going to go. I, I I just don't see it going any other way than that. And I think that the the true secret sauce is that not intentionally creating a game that is from the ground up designed to be good on Twitch. Like it's all, like I it would compare it to like forcing a game to be esports. You can't just make a competitive game and go esports is an esports game we're gonna put all this stuff around it and it's gonna become super successful it's like you don't get to dictate that actually it's uh y- there's, yeah, there's yeah. elements out of your out of, out of your control uh, a good example of that is lawbreakers ah lawbreakers how's that one doing now bad eh. bad People were excited about that though. Yeah. Like that's the thing. Like I, I feel like like they're like probably putting the whole esports thing behind it. Competitive going on. Just no one. Cared. I mean, there was a rumor that like or apparently Sony's hiring for a position for an esports lead. Yeah. To make Sony esports stuff, it's basically I, I worry about that. But you, you can't you can't force that sometimes. You can't, and that's that's what yeah. I hear a lot, and that's yeah. what we've said before is that. In terms of exposure on Twitch and creating an esports scene that people care about and 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 like grows on its own, like everybody wants it to be organic. Everybody wants it to be because the game is good and there's a lot of interest. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a really easy thing to say, but a really hard thing to think through and actually do. Where it's like, hey, we're making a game, we're throwing a lot of money behind it, we want it to be successful. How do we just make it happen organically? Like, how do you solve that problem? I can sympathize with some level on people like wanting to be like, hey, we should try to be more aware of this. We should try to incorporate these elements. Obviously, most of the time it just ends up feeling really <coughs> forced and awful, but it's it's a tough nut to crack, right? Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. How do you work around that problem? I mean, I, 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 I do sympathize because it uh, uh, pretty much any company any developer any studio working on this type of game right. this is probably going to be in the 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 workflow now that you have to come up come up with solutions to how we can make this better integrated with Twitch like sure. that is a priority for us mm-hmm. i think the problem that the pitfall that some of them might need to avoid that kind of goes with wrestling is that <laughs> success on Twitch doesn't equal success sales wise like just because you become a phenomenon on Twitch, if it's short lived, if it's flash in the pan, you got to be careful about that. Like I, I, that's why I was saying, I think you're going to see some of these games rise up really quickly on there and then fade away just as fast. And so you could be successful in achieving like short term popularity on Twitch, but the I think the tough enough crack is the long the long term one. How do you stay popular on Twitch long term? <coughs> and I think it like. You have to do a lot of your homework and look at the ones that are doing it right. There's some things that are out of your hands. There's always some things out of your hands. There's also something to be said about not just being the first of a type of a game, like the first battle royale type game, but also being the one that was like the the the, the, the best at the time, uh, the the one that had like a hook that caught on with everyone that set yourself apart from the other ones. Like in that early window, I think that's like the most crucial time. After that. It's harder to like stand out. I feel like you just gotta kind of follow the same formula, or you risk being too different. With people are like, what's this? Like you, you're not. I'm too used to this. This is too different, and it's still the same genre. Like if you're trying to do a different yeah. genre, that's fine. You're trying to shake things up. But if you're st- doing a battle royale and you do something too different, and it's just, I, I don't know. I can see people just like freaking out and be like, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, you. You talk about how crucial that early period is, and I think it's not just 
because of like people are forming their ideas about it, but it's also very popular names are building like a brand where I will see streamers who are very known for playing one particular game. Let's say they're very well known for playing Hearthstone. Anytime they play anything else, you look at their chat, you're almost guaranteed to see like, where's Hearthstone? Where's Hearthstone? Mm -hmm. Where's Hearthstone? And so we talk about like wanting to be part of the conversation where you're not only competing against these these very successful games that may have a lot of resources behind them and a, and a reputation that they've built up over years, but you're also trying to convince these people who have built their audience, their livelihood, off of streaming a particular thing. This guy is known for playing Fortnite. This girl is known for playing Overwatch. And so, like, asking them to move away from that hurts their business as well, and I think that's what yeah. makes this such a mess. Now... The way that some people have gone around that is they're like, we're going to pay you to stream our game. We're going to incentivize you to do a sponsored stream for our thing. But you look at any stream that has the sponsored tag on it, and there's just nothing but bad will from chat because there's just kind of this stench of of streaming something that was, was quote-unquote paid for. And so that generates bad vibes as well. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? What do you do when you have like two businesses that are trying to intersect? I I feel like it's obvious, but at the same time, I think it's actually kind of hard to to fully grasp understand is that is actually going to the like the established community for these other games. If you're going to enter a certain, uh, let's, let's go battle royale again. Mm -hmm. You look at what everyone's doing right of the popular ones, but you go in deep into their communities and say, what are actually what are players actually complaining about about each specific one? Like, what are they asking for? But the publishers know are saying like, we can never do that. Like, you just don't understand. Like, that's just beyond like, that's not possible with our game setup. Yeah. You be the one that says not. We're going to do that. Like. The uh, like we're gonna do that feature, or we're gonna actually do this in our game. Well, it's because we're starting it now, and we're not so ingrained in certain systems that backtracking on those will just like wreck the game. As it'll just be a different game, or it's something that you could like. Uh, sometimes I see what like what community people ask or fans ask for is actually like financial suicide for like uh, a developer. They want, you know, oh, loot boxes. If you just do this with, like, them and not charge, like, yeah, they're doing that on perks because they want to make the money. They don't want to put free. Oh, you could earn them all with in-game currency. Yeah, they're not going to do that because they that was part of their, you know, their their, their pipeline for their, their money to keep, their, to keep making the game. But someone who's starting out differently, it's like, hey, every other game out there only has paid loot boxes. No one does it strictly in-game currency. Oh, we're going to come along. We're going to be the first one to do that. And on top of that, if you watch on Twitch, you get this stuff in game. Like, you never have to spend a cent on any kind of our loot box in this game. People are like, you're crazy. You can't do that. Everyone else is doing that. I think you have to be that risk, take that big of a risk and be that bold. Is sure. find out what these other games aren't doing that are saying is impossible and say, we're going to do that. And start from there. It might not work out financially initially, but if you can get everyone around, a, a swell of people around a game, like, this game works. Like, keep please keep making this game. They'll be like, "What? Wh how can we support this game to keep it running?" The ideas will come to you about how to like you know make it sustainable. Like if you like if everyone's doing paid loot boxes because it's the only way to sustain those types of games, and you're not doing it, people are like you're gonna die out. Like you're crazy. You can't do this. So like your community will suggest to you ways like, "Hey, we would pay for this. Mm -hmm. We'd be okay paying for that." And I think that takes a level of uh, flexibility that some developers just like get freaked out about. Like, is there already enough crunch around development? It's already hard enough mm -hmm. to make games. To have that level of flexibility, like updating the game that quickly uh, at the whim of the community, I, I can see some people that's like ripping their hair out. Like, I, I can't do that. Like, that, that, that's you're asking way too much of us. But that's like the kind of like the gusto you need to do it. If you want to beat PUBG, if you want to beat Fortnite. Yes, you got to be able to like put that level of intensity out when you're making a game. Yeah, I think the the PUBG Fortnite dynamic is so interesting because I, I feel like it's echoing so much of what you're saying, where I feel like the reason Fortnite is being successful is because it 
people have a clearer vision of what it's trying to do. Like there's more transparency there. The Fortnite team is better at communicating and interacting with its fans and people are having a better experience overall. Uh, like I've, I've seen a lot of frustration from streamers about PUBG where they're like, why, why are we still dealing with these problems? And yeah. I get, I get a stronger sense of we're taking steps forward with Fortnite. And I think that is like paying huge, huge, huge dividends for that game. Uh, on Twitch and otherwise. Biggest advantage a new developer trying to enter the market has is they do not have the problem of being complacent with their success. Mm -hmm. A lot of the top leaders will just become complacent, think they're untouchable, and all it takes is someone to start looking at what their weaknesses are and come out and think one step ahead of them, like, if we just do this and this, we're actually going to be better than them and we convince enough people now with Twitch, if we get like streamers playing this, we get that number one spot. People are like, what's this other wow rail? Whoa, they're doing this. They said this couldn't be done in this game. What they're doing all of a sudden? Hey, I'm gonna try it out. <laughs> it, it has a better chance, I think, of like blowing up and being sustainable. And then all of a sudden, PUBG and Fortnite are like, uh, wait a second. Crap, they're doing that now. Crap, now we're scrambling to catch up. We either have to do the thing we said was impossible to do, or we look foolish and we're going to bleed users to that, or we got to evolve. That's that's how it is with like everything like uh, with business stuff. You just can't become complacent. But yeah, at the same time, it is it's not it's not easy. Right. <laughs> like you, you got to know what you're getting into with that. So Brad, uh see if these is coming out. Yep. And I yep, think yep, yep, yep. I you've already seen uh with the pre-release stuff that they've been doing with Sea of Thieves, that is, it's already experienced uh, some popularity on Twitch. Uh, what do you think Sea of Thieves needs to do to stay relevant and interesting and, and like Damiani was saying, compete in this very highly competitive <laughs> arena? Uh the community is the most important. Like when I see people playing Sea of Thieves, they're playing it because it's fun interacting with people in the ocean, like random people. Sure. I could easily see them doing Battle Royale. Like I could see that coming. I, f I could feel like I could see that coming to almost any multiplayer game now. Sure. I feel like you're, you're saying a uh, Battle Royale, like with a sigh. Or do you think, you know, a, if, a game if pivoting it, and if changing? It, like, is if it can, no, I don't have a problem with the game changing, pivoting. Like Fortnite was not meant, like it was not built with the idea of battle royale in mind, but sure. it worked out great for them. Like if it can happen, like I'm fine with it. But like if I was playing a game, like I don't know what, what their model with Fortnite is. If I was playing Fortnite, I was a big fan of the the other mode, the single player mode or whatever, the normal mode. Right. And I was like really into that, but I didn't care about battle royale. But then. They only care. The developers only really cared about Battle Royale and left everything else I liked about the game alone. I would get kind of annoyed. Sure, but um, yeah, Sea of Thieves. I think it's gonna be like they need to have constant updates to that game. They can't. And they need to have some sort of end game to keep people playing. Like we saw this with Destiny Two, just kind of like everyone got to the end and everyone quit. Everyone was over it. Like, will Sea of Thieves have something to keep people playing it like that? I don't know. So. Going back to the original question where I said, hey, are you worried about things kind of going in this direction? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was how you phrased it, Damiani. Um, doing what we're talking about, mm -hmm. doing those pivots, adding huge new modes, constantly keeping the community up to date, all of that takes a tremendous amount sure of resources, does, yeah. right? And if you're a game company and you're making big, expensive games and you make a lot of games, I think creating something that can have a livelihood in this this live arena that takes a tremendous amount of resources and mm -hmm. you might have to cut back on other things or cut out other things entirely yeah. are you worried about the types of experiences that you're going to be getting in the future shrinking hmm i don't know like i never know what's going to come so i can't like if something like i love gets shrinked i don't know what it'll necessarily be well Let's take a look. So, like, we're talking about... I, I really do think this is remarkable, right? We're talking about, in Mario Odyssey, this free update mm -hmm. that you got that added a new mode. In a mainline Mario game, uh, in a mainline 3D Mario game, there has never been a big downloadable update before. That is right. a new thing. Uh, as we continue, as every <coughs> single type of game that we love is trying to grab an audience on Twitch, is trying to keep people interested. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Are you ever worried that there's just going to be way too much to keep up with? Is there already too much to keep up with now? There's already too much for me to keep up. How do you We're, handle that? I, I, I pick and choose now. Sure. Uh, but are you, are you satisfied with that? Um, satisfied that I can't play everything? No, I mean... Being, like having to make choices? No, I, I think there's... What I'm saying is, does the commitment to, to a game... When, when so many games are asking more and more, mm-hmm. and they're going to keep asking more and more because there are all these factors that they have to consider, does that commitment ever weigh on you? Uh, no, not really for me. Like, I will just play something until I get tired of it. I don't I don't like feeling obligated, like I have to play a commitment kind of thing in that sense. Mm-hmm. If I'm done, I'm done. I'm moving on. Is there any skepticism that you have, Donnie, with the way things that are heading with... with- I, I, there, there, I mean, there's a skeptical side, but at the same time, like echo what, what Brad said, I mean, same thing. Like you know, if you get like you don't need to feel obligated, but I feel like, I feel like we're approaching a time when the, the old excuse is when we were younger, we only played so many games because you know that we only had so many games. So we, that's why we spend hundreds of hours on single player games because it's all we had and we loved them. We came came up with creative ways to play them. Now it's different, like. I, I feel like we're going to the same, it's different, but more the same in that people are going to start, I feel like more and more people are just going to focus on fewer games and invest more time in them because the industry, and I think people who play games are more and more embracing the whole, I hate to say it, games as a service mentality mm-hmm. that these games are constantly evolving and they're changing based on your feedback. So while you don't feel obligated, you might start to feel more invested because you're part of a community and, hey, you see everyone raising their concerns about a certain thing. You see the developer change it and address it. This isn't anything new, like a patch update, but the, the speed that's happening, like quality of life changes. Like that was something that was like before patch updates would be fixed bugs. It's like this was a major glitch. We mm-hmm. fixed it or a major feature has been introduced. Now, like in certain games, I'll see like a, a patch notes update, and I'll have like a laundry list of stuff that has not new content. So it's like we we change we like fix this. We like you know item sorting works like this now, or like display of like icons has been changed because like certain people said this. Like even down to like you know accommodating colorblind players. Like we found a new way to like visualize like area of effect attacks and stuff like that to accommodate people who can't see colors and stuff like we represent it a different way with like sound waves and stuff like i was like whoa that's insane and people feel good about that they're like wow they're like taking my stuff seriously they're actually addressing you feel like you have some kind of authority over the game's direction i mean not 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 like complete control but you feel like they'll actually listen to you and might address your concern this time. Sure. And you feel more invested in that community and you feel good about the game. It's constantly updating. It's constantly changing. In your mind, it's constantly getting improving towards what you ultimately want. Not every change is going to be a winner, but you're still kind of hooked because, oh, the, 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 that's not the end. That's not the final change. Things could still things will change beyond that. Who knows? I'm going to stick around for this. I just see people being more focused on fewer games which the skepticism is that it's that's bad news for like the, the for the game studios and publishers because there's only going to be so many games that are going to be able to get like a piece of that pie then right. when you're when you're vying for everyone who wants to be like long term invested in stuff um in games as a service there's always going to be a place for like single player offline games that's a whole different market I'm just talking about games as a service there's only so many that can be running that are successful that can be supported no matter how large the, the the market gets there's only so many people in the world well you yeah. can you can yeah. only form like this you, yeah. you're saying like the the payout for being able to form that like intimate connection with your consumers is is great but any one consumer can only have that intensive a relationship yes. with so many games a small handful at best um and what i worry about is i just i i see echoes of like the mmo craze where people just can't stop chasing the money and so they'll they'll go all in on something that there's no more room left Mm -hmm. but i i mean i I don't know how to how to fix that because with with twitch right like you always see the same things at the top occasionally you'll have something rise up and 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 rest there and i'm not saying that that top of the list can't be penetrated but i would like to see 
I would like to find a way for more types of games to thrive and exist and build communities with a live audience and make those games interesting and fun to watch for that audience without compromising, like, what makes them special. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I, I mm. think it would be cool because, like... Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I the, the, Maybe some hope I can try and give you is that no matter how much you update a game and stuff, eventually... People will get tired of it. People do move on from things. People will be invested in a single game maybe a little bit longer than before. They're still going to want something new eventually. They're, they're, they're like very, the longer you have a player invest in the game, it's diminishing returns in terms of like the the, the player base. It's going to eventually start shrinking. It'll hit its peak. It'll start shrinking no matter what you try and do to try and build it back up. It's just never going to get back to that point. So. Line A, you have people who are just getting tired with that experience and are going to eventually funnel into what's my next game. So you're still going to have, eventually, if this is what happens, eventually you're going to have these periods, these windows open where people are looking for something new. They might go to one of the already established games, or that's the time when you do have something new. Like, hey, this is the time to introduce something new. See. We're seeing a decline at point. the second little point of hope. There's always new people being born into this world. They're going to become, you know, they're going to play video games. Mm -hmm. So in, in anywhere from like, you know, a few years, to like 20 years, however long it takes them to get into video games, they might look at what we're playing now and be like, I'm not, that's, I'm not into that. You know, their, 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 their taste and stuff are going to change. What we're playing might like seem like antiquated, like PUBG, Fortnite, this game's been around for 10 years. Who wants to play this game? They're also going to be looking for something new. Because they're a younger generation, and they're also someone you should, uh, an audience you should be looking to, to see like what they're going to be into. Because think about it, like battle, like PUBG and Fortnite, like PUBG came out of nowhere, like 10, 20 years ago. You're like PUBG, what? You can you always knew in the back of your, you always could envision like there's going to be a next big online game. You just it's impossible to define it. And right. isn't it amazing each time it finally is defined? Like PUBG coming out, I was like, I was like, no. Uh, who who this it, it's huge right. who thought of it that's great i didn't think like that's so like it seems so simple but like someone had to think of it there's gonna be another one there'll be another type of game that's gonna come along that's gonna be like the next big one mm -hmm. like we started with like ever ever into, into wow wow was mmorpg then you had like all the, the the moba games coming out like you know han and then like League of Legends comes along and does it the best. And, like, you know, then you have Dota 2. So you have these two, like, MOBAs ground. Then you had, like, the next thing was, like, Hearthstone. Like, it, it, it's come in cycles. Well, and, uh, these things that you talk about, and this this was a, uh, a tone that we had during our Game of the Year conversation where we, we just kind of were in awe at how quickly and how aggressively PUBG blew up. But I think if you really sit down and break down what PUBG did, it wasn't it wasn't just a, a miracle handed down from on high. It was, this is a perfect type of game that is building on trends seen from earlier things like DayZ, but it makes it more, it, it, it condenses it, it makes it quicker, it makes it more fun to watch. It becomes a more spectator-like thing at a time where we are getting increasingly interested in watching other people play video games live. It just, all of the, the stars aligned, it was the right thing at the right time. You talk about League of Legends, it took this idea that was already popular and it, it organized it. It dumped a bunch of money into it. It formalized it in a way that really worked. Same thing with Hearthstone. It cut out a lot of the bullshit that wasn't being done before and made it more digestible for audiences. I think what my skepticism comes from is I find that the the video game industry gets too tunnel visioned on chasing something that already works being like like I, I'm worried that everybody is sitting here being like well, how can we be like PUBG and Fortnite and instead should be thinking about how can, how can we be the mm -hmm. next completely okay, different I see way what you're saying. <laughs> for sure um, and I think when you just try to chase something that has already covered so much ground you're like you're it's like it's like you're being at a dinner table and you're fighting for scraps that other people have already like divvied up when you could just go to like a completely different table and eat most of the meal. Uh, yeah, it reminds me of like uh when Heroes of the Storm came out. It's like right. you got you got League and you got Dota 2. You're right. not going to do you're not going to get close. And it's, but they, at the same time they came around and did something different with Overwatch, which is like TF2 but they kind of made it their own thing and it got huge. Sure. Uh 
Yeah, over, uh, there's a lot to talk about with Overwatch that <laughs> is interesting. Uh, but like with Heroes of the Storm specifically, it's frustrating because I really like Heroes of the Storm. Yeah, me too. I think it's a cool game. It's doing so many things different. Yeah. But we talk about that timing. It feels like it's happening. It's just too, it's way, way too, too late. late. It's way yeah. too late. And what people want in that game, those jo- or that type of genre, is not really what that game's doing. Sure. And I think to clarify earlier something I said. I think that's what I mean by the early window. Yeah. Like it, it, it's not necessarily being first. It's the first to look at what's being done in that genre and making it like the best. Like taking the trends. Cutting out the bullshit, focusing on the good stuff like League of Legends did for MOBAs, that's what Hearthstone did for like card games, for you know what PUBG is doing for battle royale type games in Fortnite after it. That like that mentality, like you just there's a that you just have to do it within that window though, and yeah. that's nebulous. You can like try and define it like it's only like within six months of the first one appearing. Like that does BS. Like maybe someone has some t- statistical analysis that's a little bit more accurate, but. That's the hard part is that that nebulous time frame of like w- like we all like I think we all three of us said like Heroes the Storm was too late. Yeah. Like was- we we think we instinctively say that, but it's like were you really thinking like did you have to find number in your head of like because it was cuz it was this much time after everything else or is this you it just you just can feel like the sense of like the the popularity of the other ones that have come before it. You, you knew what they achieved. It's like it's I it, even it, think it, it's yeah, it's like I don't even think it's necessarily the, the the popularity. I think the problem with Heroes of the Storm, right, is it is competing with juggernauts like Dota 2 and League of Legends that the people that it's going to appeal to are probably already invested in the, those games. And the reason why that is a problem is because it's not like they finished those games. These are ongoing things that are constantly getting new uh, champions, new updates, new tournaments. Like yeah. there's, there's a whole system that's constantly like changing with these things and it's enough to like keep up with just those those games or just one of those games that like trying to do the same thing with Heroes of the Storm when it's so far out is a lot to ask. I got you. So would it alleviate your skepticism if instead of Blizzard going with Heroes of the Storm, they had spent those that resources on trying to do something different other like Heroes of the Storm just didn't happen. Like like that well, would you rather them done something else, a new type of game? Or well, I, I think uh, yeah, my, my saying, skepticism yeah. comes in like Blizzard. Blizzard is so whole, big that like beast. this doesn't uh, matter. Yeah. It's not like it's not just like oh man, here's the storm is too late. They messed that up. Too bad they don't have anything else going on. No, they have they have Overwatch. They have Hearthstone. They have Starcraft. They, they wow. have Diablo. They have WoW. They, like whatever. Like it it doesn't really matter all that much. What I'm worried about are the other companies that aren't Blizzard that a failure. Is the of end. a certain scale is the end. Like they they don't they can't take the hit in the same way. Mm-hmm. And so, what I worry about is they put all of their eggs in the basket that they shouldn't be they shouldn't be chasing after that anyway. Like I think I hope that the video game industry is learning in some ways. I think that's why we see successes like hopefully Monster Hunter World and Yakuza and Nier and these things that we keep bringing up that we're so excited to see. Like, like a game like Divinity Original Sin 2 works because it's chasing after an audience that isn't fully being catered to. Yes. It knows what its strengths are, and it's super leaning in on those things. Like, yes. here is a super complicated, rich detailed, long computer role-playing game. We're going to show you why that's awesome. We're not going to try to bend this vision to anybody else. Yes. And that's what I want to see more of. I mm. want people to realize that it is okay. There are so many audiences that you can chase after. Like, find your own thing and go after it instead it of It reminds just... me of, like, uh, NIS, a lot of, like, the games they publish and stuff like that. Like it's a very specific audience and it may not be the biggest audience, but it works well enough for them that they're able to keep doing what they do. Exactly. Exactly. I just, Ooh, video games, video games. I, I think it is something that should be said for Sony as well, where I think it is fantastic that, they have kind of cultivated this image of, hey, if you want really good-looking single-player stories mm-hmm. that are, are brand new, you can come here. Yeah. That's the kind of mindset that I want from, from everybody. Cool. And I think, I think a lot of people are, do, you know, it's easy and convenient to pull out Sony, but there are a lot of modern-day examples where 
they are doing, the, they're creating their own space. I think it, that's what I'm trying to say ultimately mm-hmm. is how vital it is to create your very own space. <sighs> that was intense, Hotake. <laughs> yeah. Hotakes, Hotakes are always so interesting because I think there's kind of an inherent rambling to yeah, them. Yeah, there's like a weird vibe in the room now. Yeah, there we're is. We're all just like, uh. <laughs> Because the, the whole point is that I'm trying to introduce something that has no solution. Yeah. And so as you're trying to figure it out, right, you're, you you can't point to any solution. We can't quickly and concisely bring yeah. it up. And so it's just like kind of this messy process of trying to figure it mm-hmm. out and, and give opinions on it. But do you know what's not as messy? Or rambling, hopefully. Uh, viewer questions? Emails. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> You're on the right track. You're on the right track. Brad, we're going to bring this vibe back. Sweet. And we're going to bring it back with Morgan. He's going to be our first email okay. today. He says... I have, see Larry David. Do you, he, he, he essentially... <laughs> yeah, there's... <laughs> Yes. There's a nice picture of Larry David in the email. Uh, you're not going to be able to see this very well, but uh-huh. yeah, it's there. Anyway, uh, how vital is it? Should you, I guess, not how vital is it, should you go down with the ship? And Morgan asks, I have decided that I am going down with the ship. Oh, I my love God. the Metal Gear franchise and have seen some reviews and opinions on the latest entry, Metal Gear Survive. I hate zombies as enemies. I'm not a big fan of survival games. I do not like grind-heavy games, and I get put off by certain microtransaction, including having to pay for a second character slot. But much like the stoic captain in James Cameron's Titanic, I am going down with the ship. I have purchased Metal Gear Survive, and I'm going to play it to completion. I plan to give it a fair chance and may end up enjoying it, but something tells me that it won't be great. After this, though, I know that there will likely not be any more franchise loyalty, and much of what Konami produces will be under heightened scrutiny. Does the panel have any thoughts to share about a mismanaged franchise? Would any of you go down with a ship? And what would your reasons be? Mismanaged? Hmm. Here's what something on the internet that I really don't like, and I think Valkyria Chronicles is a good example. Uh... I know, Damiana, you said that Valkyria 4 had already been greenlit by the time Valkyria Revolution happened. Yep. But when, when we see missteps, right, when we see things bungled that we don't like or a, 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 a company is going in a direction that is bad, I think Chrono Trigger being re-released and being just completely botched and ruining everybody's hope of a surprise Chrono Trigger on Steam announcement. Like, it's really frustrating, and I think the impulse is to be like, this sucks, and just burn them at the stake, and just make memes and jokes and videos about how angry you are. I get that, but I think what we also need to do with an equal level of ferocity is tell them what we want. Mm -hmm. Like, tell them, this is not acceptable, here's why this isn't acceptable, and then tell them what we want. Like, I think it's fine to go down with the ship, but, like, don't always abandon hope that the ship is sunken forever. You know, I think you I think you have to try to be productive if you care about these things. Dude. Sometimes the ship is just... Great example. Up. Yeah. The Resident Evil boat, the boat sank, man. I was <laughs> treading water, dude. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this sucks. This is not what I want from this yeah. series. Sure. And they lifted it up from the water. <laughs> brand new spanking boat they listened that, that that that's a good point though ben uh, i mean i hope people try and do that uh whenever there is the initial re- like negative reaction to something that seems like the doom and gloom um or the no hope scenario for a, a series or a follow-up installment I, I i i mean yeah valkyrie i think enough people just i mean yeah we know sega green let it but if they hadn't i, I believe the community was basically like Sega, all we wanted was a proper <laughs> sequel to Valkyria Chronicles 1. Yeah. Uh, it, it, everything just kept going in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. Portable game, a portable Japanese only game we didn't even get, and then a spinoff that wasn't anything we asked for. <laughs> oh, it's like Kingdom Hearts, man. It was just, it, the, yeah, it just went the wrong Stop way. Stop giving me handhelds. And, I, and there's some frustrating communities. Like, I think the community is like, can we, get Valky- can we get a console Valkyria Chronicles sequel? Can we get a console Valkyria Chronicles sequel? How many times do we have to say that? I think it also goes two ways sometimes. There is some amplified level of frustration when the community is asking for something, and then the publisher gives you something 
other than that. Right. There are times when communities have been proven wrong, where a publisher is like, this is a new type of game. We have we have a lot of confidence in it. Please give it a chance. Community is like, eh, it's going to be dumb. Mario and Rabbids. Let's say Boom. that. Oh, man, that's a terrible idea. And you're just like, whatever, it's coming. You will be ashamed of your words and deeds, Boy. community. Um, Mario Rabbids comes out. I was like, Boy. crap, we were wrong about that one. Reminds me of uh, Metroid Prime. Metroid Prime is yeah. another great one where it's like, oh, what are you doing? Giving yeah. it to a Western studio? <laughs> it's in first, you're trying to yeah. be like a Halo now? You're trying to turn Metroid into Halo Nintendo? Pfft, I'm done with this series. Goodbye. Yeah. Oh, crap. Then now it's like, it's not first person? Yeah. <laughs> Brad, <laughs> when, when there's a series that you love takes a direction sure. that uh, you clearly don't like or don't think you'll like, mm-hmm. How obligated do you feel to, to see what it is? Uh, it depends on the series, man. It depends how close I am to it. All right, let's say Zelda. I'm trying it. Like, Zelda's, okay. like, top tier. Zelda is, is Zelda's number but one? Like, Zelda, I'm trying no matter what. Like, Kingdom Hearts, I'm trying no matter how stupid it sounds to me. I'm trying. Have you tried every Kingdom yes. Hearts thing? Yeah. Played the phone game, tried it out. Like, oh, how is that phone game? I don't really like it. <laughs> I just don't, I don't like phone games that much, period. Yeah. I don't know. But it's like, I, tr- I played all the stupid DS ones that I didn't like. Quick aside, for no reason at all, I am I've played a little bit of Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links on the phone. Dude. Yeah. Yes. Let's just let that sit for a second. And the presentation is like kind of amazing. Like <laughs> I haven't played a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! games, but I feel like they kind of get the the vibe of the show. Like it looks really good, it feels really good. They like the way that the the, the two players communicate with each other feels very evocative of the anime. Like the core of it seems really cool, but every time I log in, it's like, hey, do you know you can do this? Don't forget about this. Here's your bonus for here. Here's the special bonus. And it's just like, I have to like go through like 10 different things before I can just fling some cards and be some spiky haired anime boy that I just get kind of pissed off. And I just needed, I needed, there's no point here. There's no broader point. I'm not even trying to try mm-hmm. it in here. I just need to express that. On frame trap for a second. Oh, dude, it's like frustrating. I'm thinking of like what Dumb Man was saying. When it's like we just want this, make this, they do something different. It's like uh, Dragon's Dogma. Yeah, we're like just give us Dragon's Dogma two, mm. like how we want it, like just like Dragon's Dogma one. And they just like make some online game, and it's like oh, just I'm kidding. No one, making an no game. one gets it though in the West. Yeah, you're just like cool, dude. That's the problem. It's also I saw an example of like where maybe the. Uh, the community doesn't know what to ask for, mm-hmm. but it's also the the series has gone in a bad direction. Star Fox, yeah. Like w- w- we actually, I asked this question of the panel re- uh, on a previous episode of Franco. Yeah. So like, what do you for Star Fox's birthday? Like, what do you do with Star Fox at this point? They've handed it off to a lot of different developers to try different things, but. Like, what is, what do you go point to? What do you want? Like, I think Star Fox is such a brilliant example because it's like, we want it to feel like this, but be completely new and fresh. Yeah, it's yeah. like, Star Fox Zero was like, okay, they forced some weird control scheme down your throats. But take that away, was that really a great game if you just played it with normal controls? It was another remake of Star Fox 64, which was, I mean, it was a remake of Star Fox, Star Fox 64. It was a remake of the original Star Fox. It was like... All right, what do you do here? And like, we were struggling to come up with ideas. Like, maybe actually give the from the ground up development to Platinum and let them see what they could do with it. But would that even be good? Like, it, it, yeah, there's some series where it's like frustrating because you just don't know what to do with it. I, I think Breath of the Wild set a very good example. Like, break that up. Give me something completely different. Mm-hmm. Like, blend genres with Star Fox. Like, I, like it's at a point... Star Fox of the Wild. Yeah, they did, they did yeah. Star Fox Adventure already. It's pretty pretty bad. But that wasn't a Star Fox game originally. I mean, I want to be flying ships. That's yeah. the one... I mean, yeah, like, you gotta. Like, that's, the one thing that's not what Star Fox Adventure was or whatever. Yeah. You're on a dinosaur playing with a spear. Get out of here Man, with that. Get I was, out of here. I was so excited for Star Fox Adventures, and, like, that was a game that I rented... Me too. And Rented. Just, like, Ooh. it's like one of those things where you start playing it and you have this huge smile on your face, mm-hmm. and then as you're playing it, it just because it sinks. starts off in like the the R wing too. You're like, nice. Then I just I didn't like that game. Uh, our next email comes in from Christopher, and he says, "Not everything needs to be on the Switch." Okay. The Switch is one year old. One year old. As someone who had been around that whole time, I love that tablet dearly, but I want to. 
talk about an issue revolving around the system. People have consistently complained over the last year in situations where a game was announced for all platforms except the Switch. I've seen comments of people that have multiple consoles but refuse to buy certain games simply on the basis that there isn't a Switch version. Well, I think that it's good to be vocal about bringing games to Switch, I've seen a lot of feedback that hasn't been so supportive of developers. A lot of people were uncertain of the Switch's success before the console finally came out, and unless developers were planning ahead, we Mm. wouldn't see day and date versions. Porting a game isn't as easy as a copy and paste, after all. I just get upset when I see these complaints, as I think they aren't always grounded in rationality. Allies, what do you think? Is it the responsibility of developers and publishers to be more communicative about which of their games will come to the Switch? Is it their responsibility to bring games to the Switch at all? Do you get emotionally crushed when some anticipated titles aren't on Switch? Or are you content with what's already there? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm sure people have unreasonably asked for certain games to be on Switch that probably don't make sense. Uh, they made a good point at the beginning. Everyone in their right mind who was a third-party developer did not embrace the Switch initially, with very few exceptions, because the Wii U is a complete failure. Yep. Well, no one was going to, like, jump on board except for, like, a handful of, like, really loyal... Ubisoft. Yeah. Ubisoft and uh, and uh, uh, Hudson. So, mm-hmm. Like, here's Bomberman, and here's, uh, <laughs> yeah, here's a few things. Like, th- people threw out a few things at the beginning. It's like, that's really all we're giving you, Nintendo, because... We use a disaster. So yes, everyone like, and and most everyone came around and eventually said, "Hey, Switch is a success. We've got stuff in the pipeline. Calm down. Like we're not." I think there was some resentment from some of the more Nintendo centric consumers who were like accusing third parties, like you just Switch is successful. Where are the ports? Where are the games for it? And it's mm-hmm. like, it takes time for those games. Capcom said, "Yes, we got stuff in the works. It takes time." And everyone like Bandai Namco was like, we got stuff. It just we didn't embrace it at first. Like, get it chill out. And I, I I I see the request. Some of them I think are unreasonable. Like Monster Own World. People are like, why is Monster Own World not on Switch? I was like, you really want to play Monster Own World on Switch? I was like, I get you might want to play it on the go, but at the same time, that game is gonna run like trash on mm-hmm. the Switch. No, like gotta be realistic here. It's probably a game you don't want to play on the Switch. You probably want a Monster Hunter game on Switch, which you're gonna get. You know. Uh, you got it in Japan already. I don't yeah. they come out here yet. No, 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 no. Cross. Yeah. double cross. Yeah, it's just pain. But you will. There will eventually be a Monster Hunter game on Switch that is tailored to Switch's you know hardware that you'll get. So chill out. Just wait for it. Man, I don't know if I feel so as confident about that given the success of World. I oh, I think we'll given the success of World and how successful Switch is in Japan and here, there's definitely going to be a Monster Hunter. I think oh, you'll there get definitely a, be a, a Monster different Hunter. Monster Hunter. It yeah. won't be World. It'll be another like yeah. like lower graphic fidelity Monster Hunter that'll be on Switch and I, I, I guarantee that's going to happen okay. at some point in the lifespan of this. But going forward, like there are some games I can see. There are some games that aren't very graphically intensive. Um that have come out. A lot of the indies have embraced Switch, but there have always been games that haven't necessarily been on the Switch from the get-go. And people ask, that was a game that makes perfect sense to be on the Switch, but it's not on there. And there's certain reasons. Uh, one of them was uh, the Disney Collection. Remember yeah, that thing? New collection, so it yeah. seemed like such a simple thing from Capcom early on. And it was like, why is that not on Switch? They're like, it's so simple Especially and easy. Especially because all those games were on Nintendo. Yeah. I- in, in my opinion, I feel like it is a complaint that will resolve itself, whereas the Switch grows in maturity, where th- these types of instances are going to happen less and less. Like, yes, there of course there will be some games yes. announced that you want on Switch that won't be, but I, I think it's just the system is still relatively young, and this this is a problem that won't be a problem within the next year. Yeah, you, you summed it up. Like, give it enough time, this will die down and go away. I know to an extent it's annoying, but... Just be patient. It, 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 will, it will subside. Yes. It will definitely subside. Try not to let the internet noise bring you down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Our last email of the day comes in. This is, this is very relevant to this panel. Xenoblade 2, the ultimate love slash hate game. This is from Mike. <laughs> ben, after hearing you discuss Xenoblade a number of times, when my wife got me a Switch for Christmas last year, she got me the standard Mario and Zelda, but also Xenoblade 2. There was a lot to love about the game, but there was also... Bond Blade and Tiger Tiger, both of which were fun at first but quickly became tedious due to how often you had to work with both mechanics to get anything meaningful out of them. 
uh, when you open 99 legendary core crystals in a row with over 900 luck and you get none of the remaining <laughs> four blades you need that only come from bonding. Oh That's just God. not okay. Yeah. <laughs> there are also a lot of little paper cut level annoyances. Bad voice acting for some characters and battle dialogue that could be shut off if you are willing to sacrifice other dialogue elsewhere. Field skill activation on a collection point that would extend how long it took to get set items by 10 or so seconds. That dragged down the overall experience over the 200 hours we played it. That is a long time. I can't recall any game I've ever started to hate so much while also being unable to put it down because I was also enjoying <laughs> it so much. Does the panel have any games where they had this duality of feeling toward it and not just for part of the game, but throughout your entire playthrough? Uh, yeah, that game. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that game. Xenoblade 2. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Uh, yeah, well, you, it. Did, did Mike basically sum up your feelings or were there other things at play there? Uh, he covered like most of my bases I can think of right now. So, like, like the Tiger Tiger game, I just like, I was like, I'm not using Poppy. I... That I mean, that didn't bug me as much. My thing was they just Xenoblade was two was constantly disappointing me in terms of <laughs> small quality of life mishaps, like things that had been done in other games for years after Xenoblade one had come out, and since X has come out, that just weren't there. Simple things such as the map, the map interface, bringing up the map, being able to see where you are, how many different step how many button inputs it took to get to mm -hmm. it i was like are you kidding me why can't i i was like i was like xenoblade dev team i'm gonna give you a list of five games go look at them just do the map exactly like they do it just please do that the filters the filters they like the uh, apparently there's a dev quote saying like you had to met they wanted you to memorize all the gathering locations in the game instead of putting them on the map i was like no no, you don't do that in 2018. I'm sorry. Like, we've all been spoiled with, like, like markers and stuff. I was like, like Final Fantasy XI. It's like, they want us to go back to the Final Fantasy XI style where talk with people and they get, they open up the wiki. I was like, no. So that quality of life stuff, which they started to try and improve with the most recent patch, uh, I, I, I feel like that needed to be there from day one. So sure. that was aggravate constantly aggravating me. Um, another one was just... Uh, the way it leads you on, it, people were arguing that it was part of the game's nature of fostering go out and explore and you're going to get lost a lot versus I just want to stay on the critical path, the critical story path. I don't want to get lost if I'm following that. There is a moment. It happened again in my second playthrough. That's what I was going to bring up if we if we discuss Xenoblade 2. Mm -hmm. uh, after you do, you rescue uh, Nia. And you have to go to the shipyard on a different part of the whatever the heck Garmont Titan or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to go to like the left side, but like where it starts you after like after you like finish that quest line after that story quest line, you have Nia. Where they put you and where the way uh, it's not even a way marker. It's the final destination. It's not on the current map, so you can't view the maps to see where it is. is that you got to find north? the path. Yes, yeah, so you got to find the yeah. path. Oh my god! And. I got lost again on a second time. I was getting so angry. I was like, "Chat, this is what I was talking about. I've already beat this game. I know I gotta. I know it's that that valley path you gotta go down to that little abandoned like warehouse house looking thing with a ship with the yeah. no pond there, and then like the kids were tormenting. I'm like, I've done this. How do I get there again? Where's it, on the map? It happened to me in both Xenoblade Chronicles One, Xenoblade Chronicles X, and also, of course, in Xenoblade Chronicles Two, where they go out of their way to give you really interesting geography where there's a lot of like pass or things nestled in or like extended or like weird curves and topography. But the map that they give you does such a piss poor job <laughs> of like communicating on a like at a glance level how all that stuff is laid out. And so like there are so yes. many times where there'll be a marker and it's like, I need to go there and it's just, it's on the map, but the map is not giving me any real sense of how to get there. And, of course, you like you said, people argue that they want you to get lost, but it's like you have to give like some sort of pointer. A, giving you a, a general idea of how this even exists does not ruin the sense of it. Yeah, if you want to stay on the crypt path, like this is kind of important. They could have gone on any number of ways to solve this. 
an actual waypoint in between your final destination and there. Like a waypoint on the existing map that ha helped guide you a little bit more. Like you're looking in this general region. Go here. Around right. this spot you can't even see on a different map. It's like, I have no idea they get there. Or even like the old trick of a cutscene. Like, hey, we're coming out of like saying Nia from the, the Dreadnought ship or whatever. Oh, so uh, Rex, we got to go up this way. And the camera like maybe just pans Zones up a over there, yeah. It's like, oh, that's like one of the oldest tricks of the books. Or even just dialogue saying... There's going to be a path up here. When I Googled it, because I was like, okay, I'm not wasting time on this again. Like, first time I played through it, I toughed it out, figured it out eventually after, like, however long it took. This time, I'm like, no, I'm opening on Google. When I searched for it, so many results came up for that specific quest objective. The like, guides how to do it. And they're like, this is probably the part where you're going to get lost in Xenoblade Chronicles. I was like, come on. Like, this is like, like, if everyone's complaining about this, or a lot sure. of people... This is kind of on you, development team. It's not on the player base for this. And the, the like, just small moments like that were enough to just, like, I was having such a good time, like, going forward, exploring again, like, seeing the zones. Like, yeah, it's a new game plus. It's supposed to be, I want to move through at a brisk pace. It's fun again. And then wasting so much time, like, oops, where do I go here? I was like, oh, th it was just so frustrating. I couldn't, I was like, can't deal with this right now makes me appreciate breath of the wild so much more we're in that world i'm like i How have the tools to, to maneuver this world sure yeah i mean we jones and multiple eyes have said it but like i don't think climb everything would be a bad thing to steal for for any no because so I, I played horizon after it yeah and i was like oh just climb up this rock yep 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 uh <laughs> my ultimate love hate game i agree with like a lot of the complaints that were being levied against Xenoblade 2 there, but that's not my ultimate love-hate game. My ultimate love-hate game is fucking Hearthstone, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, 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 I go through phases with it, and I have there since, like, go. 2013, but there are so many things in that game. No game brings me so quick to anger than Hearthstone, and it's like... It's, it always feels like it's a race to the bottom, like a new expansion will come out and you're so excited and they're trying all these cool, crazy new things and that's awesome. But then something will be broken and it'll be clearly broken and everybody will be using it because it's broken. Oh my God. And the team takes months and months and months and months and months to dude, even try to do that's something. Just, dude, that's it. just Blizzard. Blizzard are so slow and bad about that. Like I remember Overwatch, just like the the reign of mercy. I, I just, I just... I've been following this game for so long. Just like, hurry up! It's just like take, Blizzard. Like, you have the money and the resources. Why are you taking so long? And now mm. they're they're adding a tournament mode, and it's like people have been complaining about this forever. And it's just it's it's immensely frustrating that they seem to move at a glacial pace and they don't communicate things very well. And people have had the same types of complaints for years now, and it's just aggravating. But you you keep checking in. You keep taking that peek. Because there's something there. Yeah. There's there's that little Always bit little of magic. Yeah. There's that little bit of magic that is there. But yeah, I I just all I'm saying, and I I think Overwatch actually does a better job with it. It does a better game. job, I think. Communication goes a long way. Yeah. People are willing to put up with waiting if you just are like, hey, this is what's going on. That's all I want to see more of. And I know they try, and I know it's hard, and I know it's easy to be an asshole on a podcast yeah, and lobby absolutely. complaints. But and like, and it's, I think it's like depends how you give them like feedback too exactly exactly like, and as people who deal with feedback it can be really hard to want to engage with it when it's like not constructive or interesting or it's like you didn't even you didn't even watch this yeah because we we talk about the things yep, that yep, you're, yep. you're complaining about so yeah how you phrase feedback is very important but yeah that's gonna be it for a frame yeah, yeah, yeah we're almost at exactly three hours hmm Thanks for talking games. Thanks for talking yeah, Shadow of the Colossus. Yeah. Thanks for talking Final Fantasy XI with me, Bradley Ellis, Michael Damiani. If you would like us to chew on your email, you can email askeasyallies at gmail.com. If you want to find out more about us, the best place to go is patreon.com slash easyallies. And we will see you next time.